evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Washington <laughs> County Board of Education. I call to order this meeting, and we have all board members present, so we do have a quorum. This time, I invite you to stand with us as, as we do the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Time will have approval of this evening's agenda. Is there a motion? Move for approval of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Yeah. So, um, You're on. <laughs> <laughs> President Williams, uh, I'd like to make a motion to amend tonight's agenda to add an action item under old business titled Amendment to the 2021-22 School Calendar. Second. Thank you, Mr. Gasford. We have a motion and a second to amend this evening's agenda to add an action item under old business titled Amendment to the 2021-2022 School Calendar. All those in favor of the amendment? Okay, we have unanimous approval of the amendment. We'll move now to address the amended agenda. Is there a motion for that? Do we need it? We yeah, already have a motion, so we'll yeah. vote on the motion <coughs> of the agenda as amended. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the agenda as amended? <coughs> And we have unanimous approval. Thank you. This time we'll have approval of the minutes. Mrs. Williams, I move for the approval of the, approval of the closed session minutes dated Tuesday, February 15, 2015. Thank you, Mr. Gilford. Is there a second? second. Thank I'm you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. February 15, 2022. <laughs> Not 2015. <laughs> I will second that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Zittmeyer. <laughs> We're off to a good start, aren't we, this evening? <clears throat> okay, uh, so we have a motion to accept the minutes of the closed session of February 15th, 2022, and a second. All those in favor of approval? All right, we have seven affirmatives, so we have approval of that set of minutes. And I move for the approval of the business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, February 15th, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Are there any additions or corrections to that set of minutes? No. Nope. All those in favor of approval of the business meeting minutes of February 15th, 2022. Okay, we have a unanimous vote and the student member concurs. And, uh, prior to public comment, I always read from Policy KD um, with regard to procedures for public comment at business meetings. Each person wishing to address the Board of Education is encouraged but not required to sign up prior to the meeting and may address <coughs> any topic concerning Washington County Public Schools accept personnel or student matters which clearly identify an individual or individuals. Each speaker may speak for up to five minutes. The chairperson reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on any particular topic provided the issue in question has been presented and further comments would simply be repetitious. Following a speaker's presentation, the superintendent may designate a staff member to address that individual's concern or may ask the speaker to contact a particular department or a particular staff member at an appropriate time. Ms. Williams, 
Yes. May I just say that there will be two times to speak tonight, one for the, the meeting and then one for the budget hearing. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. With regard to our agenda, following um, re um, board member response to public comment, should there be any, there will be a report from the uh, Budget Advocacy and Review Committee and following that we will recess our business meeting and we will convene a public hearing and as part of that public hearing there is public comment. Then we will adjourn from the public hearing and then we will reconvene the business meeting, conduct <coughs> the rest of our business meeting. So at this time I'd like to call Mr. Neil Becker. Mr. Becker? Public hearing. That's all right. Thank you. My mistake. I see that heading at the top. Riley Bach, B A C K. Ms. Bach? Good evening. Ms. Bach, Mr. Bickford is our timer, and he has some signs, five minutes. Uh -huh. 30 seconds left to hold that up and then wrap it up, have that up, just wrap it up. Thank you. Yep. When you're ready. Um, good evening, President Wing, Vice President Calvin, <coughs> Association members. My name is Riley Bach, and I'm on the Washington County Association of Student Councils Board of Student Leaders. I'm also a senior at Boonesboro High School who attends HCC through the STEM Middle College Program. I'd like to show my support in updating the class ranking system and taking the class rank off student transcripts while still recognizing valedictorian and salutatorian proposed in file AKA, IKA. As a middle college student, I take college classes full time and those classes are very challenging courses. Some of the courses I've taken in the past two years include Calc 2, Calc based physics, and organic chemistry to name a few. Now you'd think that a college level class would be weighted on the same scale as AP classes considering that AP classes are often described as having college coursework. But no, not a single course that I have taken in my four semesters at HCC has been weighted on a five-point scale. Um, at most, they are weighted on a 0 0.72 points more instead of a full point higher. To further emphasize this point, I'd like to take a look at my own transcript. I took one AP class in high school, as most excelling students at Boonesboro take AP government as their sole advanced placement course their sophomore year. The AP government class I took is the, <coughs> took is the class most students start their advanced placement journey with and it is weighted more than the organic chemistry class I completed last semester. For some more perspective, organic chemistry is a class that is commonly known to knock people out of medical programs due to its extreme difficulty. But alas, we are not here today to discuss the unfairness of the weighting system. We are here to discuss class rank, although they do work hand in hand. Due to the nature of the weighting system in the STEM middle college program, I had virtually no chance of being valedictorian or even coming close, especially when you take into account that I started college completely online at 16 years old majoring in chemistry. Now, I do understand that it was my choice to join the STEM Middle College program, but I should not be punished for wanting to push myself to a higher standard and work towards my goals at a faster pace. My class rank is listed on my transcript for every college that I apply to to see. This is very stressful considering my class rank is not on par with my academic abilities as a student and I cannot express that thought to my colleges I apply to. They only get to see my ranking, not the story behind it. It is unfair to penalize me and other middle college students when we work extremely hard to maintain our grades. Not to mention that every single class is completed in one semester. My class rank does not accurately convey my abilities because I was at a disadvantage from the moment I signed up for this STMC program. And that is quite a shame considering how lucky I am that Washington County Public Schools offered such an amazing opportunity for me to start furthering my education so early. I do support the continuation of valedictorian and salutatorian though, as those are both major accomplishments and should be recognized as great achievements. Based on my previous remarks, you can understand why I'm in support of updating the system and taking class rank off of transcripts. I would also like you to know that I'm not the only middle college student who feels this way. I appreciate your time and your willingness to hear a take on the subject from someone in my position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Falk. Pam Adspong. Good evening. Good evening, President Williams, Dr. Michael, esteemed board members, supervisors, colleagues, and friends. 
I'm Pam Abson. I am an employee of WCPS. I work at Williamsport High School as an intervention teacher. I'm also certified in social studies and English as well as uh, administration. As you can see by my gray hair, uh, this is not my first rodeo. I've done this a few times and this is actually my fifth decade in which I've been in education. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak before you as one of your employees and as someone who is hopefully positively contributing to your community. I wanna to say to the board that it was a courageous step and I appreciate you taking it to allow the early outs for students to leave. I have personally encountered numerous meaningful, professional, strategical sessions where teachers can actually sit and work on issues to help students. And that comes directly from your courageous step to offer that and to allow that. And I wanna thank you for that. That's very meaningful and very helpful. As you know, students are struggling. Staff in some cases are struggling as well. You have experts in the house. Your teachers know your students. We've been back with them for the better part of a year. We see where they are, where they're going, where they've been. We understand and know the challenges, and many of us would like to think we could be part and would like to be part of the solution. I'd like to challenge the board to consider allowing schools to set priorities for their students as they return in the fall. Poll the faculty. What do we see are our major needs in the school? What are the solutions? Not a problem or a gripe session, but a way to find ways to best reach our students. And every school is going to be different. So that faculty that's there under that leadership that you guys have chosen is a way to find those solutions in-house. In particular, I have a great concern about phones. And I know this has been in and out. I've been in Washington County. This is my sixth year. And we've had conversations back and forth about this or that. I'm not as entertaining, believe it or not, as Phineas and Ferb, Andy Griffith, or the Sweet 16 basketball playoffs. I'm just not. I am funny, but I'm not that entertaining. So when I'm competing against that with a student in a classroom, they're probably not going to be really interested in reading comprehension strategies at that point. I'd like to ask you to consider taking another bold and courageous step. Thinking of our students first, our students are connected to those phones. They have been their lifeline. <clears throat> Some people would say that they're addicted. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But it is definitely part of their being. If they come to school with nothing else, not even their lunchbox, they have their phone. Whether their Chromebook's charged or not, their phone is charged and their earbuds are charged and they're ready to roll when Phineas comes on. I'd like for the board to consider a policy that would give the school support to be able to address the phone issue. I'm not suggesting anything in particular. I don't know the answer, but I know the problem. And I could privately or with, with supervisors say, here's some thoughts that I have. Here's some things that might work, but not from me. It should come from the teachers and from the staff because they all are with their students and again, and what fits one may not fit all. So I'd just like to challenge you again to be courageous as I've seen you be in the past and stand up for our students and for your staff. I wanna thank you for your support and for your purposeful mindset that to best serve our students and to support the staff of Washington County Public Schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Wendy Rogers. Good evening. My name is Wendy Rogers and I have taught at Hickory Elementary for the past 12 years. Hickory was built in 1975 and it's one of the last remaining schools in the county with an open floor plan, meaning that most of our classrooms have no walls. Approximately seven years ago, partitions were installed, and approximately five years ago, our library was refurbished by FedEx. Our state-rated building capacity is listed on the WCPS website as 265, with a locally rated capacity of 241. Our current student enrollment is 311, with nearly 60 staff. We are a Title I school and have been so for over 20 years, with an 80 
nearly 82% poverty rate and 45 English language learners, and that number continues to rise. As a Title I school, students receive free breakfast and lunch daily, and the student to teacher ratio is expected to be 20 to one or less. According to WCPS Facilities Master Plan, Hickory Elementary is projected to exceed its state rated capacity through 2030. The staff at Hickory are some of the finest educators I have ever known who work very hard to make our school welcoming and to support our students as well as each other. Although we do our best to find the positives, there are some areas of growth that affect the students and staff who support them. Every student in our district deserves the best learning environment. As you know, before the pandemic, WCPS planned to construct several new schools in order to consolidate. Hickory was identified as one of those schools. As a result, any projects or maintenance deemed unnecessary were put on hold. Although we were over capacity and had been promised portables, those plans did not proceed. During the pandemic, all new construction was delayed for 10 years. Unfortunately, our enrollment continues to be over building capacity and the building continues to decay at an alarming rate. Although we had been promised portables for many years prior to the pandemic, we have yet to see a single portable delivered. We currently have intervention teachers teaching in hallways and outside of bathrooms. Our behavior school, our behavior, excuse me, our school counselor and EL teachers are housed in closets. Our behavior support team is housed in an alcove with only a partition between them and the kindergarten classes. First, second, and third grades, approximately 100 students, share one boy's bathroom with two stalls and one girl's bathroom with two stalls. And the teacher workroom slash lunchroom is on the stage in the gym with the music room on one side and only thin temporary walls between the gym and the music room and very little heat. Adding to our issues, our ventilation system hasn't been cleaned in years. Our building electrical system was not designed to handle the technology of today. The cabinets underneath our sinks are mildewed. The water from some of our pipes has tested positive for lead multiple times over the years. Several years ago, when our concrete block walls were repainted, it was necessary to remove the original carpet from the walls. Yes, original carpet from the walls. Mold was found under the carpet and was cleaned before painting, but there were several other walls with carpet that were either left alone or covered with drywall without being checked for mold. Work orders and maintenance for our most struggling buildings and for our schools that are in the most disrepair should be prioritized. School buildings should be a safe place for students and staff. There are concerns that the outstanding maintenance issues negatively impact the learning environment for students, the working environment for staff, and could impact the health of staff and students. The elected board should formally and publicly invite our commissioners to take a few days to visit our schools so that they too can understand the crisis that we are in. Staffing shortages and pandemic protocols such as lunch in the classrooms have resulted in our one and only guidance counselor and our intervention teachers, English language learner teachers, behavior support staff, and other integral non-classroom teachers to be pulled from their primary duties consistently to cover lunch shifts and act as substitute teachers, preventing those teachers from pro providing the necessary services to our EL and other students that they primarily support. There are many concerns about student and staff mental health. We continue to see ever-increasing violent behaviors in the classroom. I personally have been hit by students, had chairs thrown across my room, desks and tables flipped, and watched as parts of my room were destroyed by students who could not contain their anger. We need more behavior programs for students and more health mental health care interventions that go beyond extra counselors and for the students and beyond six EAP sessions for staff. We need our ESP staff to be paid a livable wage so that we can retain those staff who work so closely with our most vulnerable students. Many of our students rely on our school meals, yet our free meals consist of low protein, high sugar, highly processed foods such as cocoa puffs, cinnamonies, chocolate chip muffins, cheeseburgers, chicken nuggets, pizza, macaroni and cheese, corn dogs, and nachos. Studies show that these add to the negative behaviors of children. Surely we could partner with local farmers and FFA groups and to include healthier options for students. In terms of staffing or building, for our building, in the past 12 years, our school has been a revolving door of administrators, 10 in all. Some moved up after only a year or two while others moved for other reasons. To fully meet the needs of our students and to provide the quality education they deserve, we need more space, more staffing, and a fully funded budget by the county commissioners. I recognize that with the school budget underfunded by the county commissioners, many projects cannot proceed. However, there are things that can be done. I invite you to visit our school and see what a typical day looks like for our students and our staff. I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and ask that you take time very soon to visit our school. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Is 
like to speak during public comment? Okay, then we'll move to board member response to public comment. Colleagues? Mr. Pickford. I'm to speak to the Boonsboro student. We have our policy committee meeting tomorrow. We also received several emails um, with similar sentiments and we'll be discussing that in policy. And I know Mr. Gupta will be there as well to present his case. So thank you for coming tonight and presenting that. I just want to echo what uh, Mr. Bickford said. Um, I fully support uh, the removal of uh, class rank off of transcripts. Um, I'll save my longer version <laughs> for the uh, policy committee meeting tomorrow, but I really believe it's an important issue. Um, and I believe that it's something we can do to help the mental health of our students, um, and it doesn't cost us any money. And that's really what I'm looking to do. So, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Okay, under reports to the board, and we will begin reports to the board with one item, and then we will continue with reports to the board uh, following personnel action later in the meeting. At this time, we have um, a recommendation from the Budget Advocacy and Review Committee, <coughs> fondly known as BARC. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, this is relative to the Board of Education's fiscal year 2023 draft general fund operating budget. So we have with us Mr. Pru, our Chief Operating Officer, and the BARC liaison. And I'm sorry I don't have your name, but Mr. Pru, I'm sure is about to introduce you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Williams, Dr. Michael, members of the board. Uh, as as a, a brief introduction, uh, after the board adopted their draft budget, uh, the uh, Budget Advocacy and Review Committee met uh, two evenings uh, over uh, a two-week period to review the budget, discuss the budget, uh, talk about additional recommendations that they felt maybe were necessary and to help the, the advocacy uh, members uh, understand what was in the budget. Uh, with me this evening is uh, Ms. Uh, Kristen Milkerick, and she is uh, the new chair of the, uh, of the BARC. Uh, you'll notice it's not the same face you saw with Mr. Hummel for so many years, uh, but Kristen graciously stepped up and took the reins this year. We're uh, pleased to do that, and at this time, I think I'll turn it over to Kristen. Uh, to, and and the, the, the committee's report is in your packet, uh, and I think she's just going to highlight a few of the points that the committee felt strongly about. Good evening. Thank you. I, I am here representing Bark, but I am also the mom of a 10th grader at North High, so thank you. I appreciate the time to be able to be here with you all. Um, again, I won't go through the whole, uh, the whole review, but um, I did want to mention that the members of the Budget Advisory Review Committee are in full support of the draft 2023 uh, general fund budget and its proposed adoption by the Board of Education on March 15, 2022. The committee applauds the superintendent and the Board of Education for prioritizing the needs of staff by establishing a significant resource pool in an attempt to augment the limited raises that were provided over the last two years. The committee agrees with the shift in staffing from restric restricted grants to the general fund to maintain programs that began under previous federal and state grants. The committee agrees with the inclusion of additional counselors in schools to meet the immediate emotional, need, emotional needs of students. In response to numer numerous citizen and staff concerns, the committee also recognizes a need for additional student resources and classroom supports to close achievement gaps. The Washington County community should be pleased to see a Board of Education budget request that is an increase over the, past, over the previous year of only 6.28% when inflation has grown by 7.5% in the last year. Most importantly, the state is providing 85% of the new revenue to this budget, minimizing the impact on, locals, on the local tax base. However, the Board of County Commissioners and citizens of Washington County, it's recommended by the BARC Committee, should consider whether this budget fulfills the needs of the community or their collective vision for the public education for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCarrick. Colleagues, any questions, comments? regarding the Clark's recommendation. I, I just wanted to say I really appreciated the report. Thank you for all the work you did on it. It is very helpful to see this all listed out it was and some confirmations of <laughs> some, some things we suspected. So, Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to the work of the board. Yes. I read the report. Everything was clear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. 
time. We will recess from our business meeting. And I will call to order the public hearing. This is a time for the public uh, to comment on the Board of Education's fiscal year 2023 draft general fund operating budget. And we have um, a different set of procedures with regard to public comment for public hearings. Again, this comes from Policy KD. Persons desiring to speak at such public hearings are encouraged but not required to register through the superintendent's office prior to the date of the meeting or register at the location of the meeting up to one half hour in advance of the commencement of the hearing. Persons speaking as individuals will be allotted three minutes and those representing an organization will be allotted five minutes. No presenter may waive all or a portion of his or her allotted time to permit someone who has not properly registered to speak. At this time, I have one person on the sign-up sheet, and that is Mr. Neil Becker. Madam President, is it the same time limits as our normal public? Three minutes for an individual, five minutes for an organization. Sorry, I read, teacher. I I was, read it. Sorry, teacher. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I'll write your name down, Mr. Victor. You're going to make note of that in your assessment. That's right. <laughs> That'll go on the permanent record. Okay. Mr. So Becker. Down for you, Mr. Becker. Uh, thank, thank you, you uh, President Williams, uh, board members, Dr. Michael, and staff. Uh, a synopsis of my comments is, is uh, going down the, the dais. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to share a few thoughts in this budget hearing. Uh, you heard most of the same thoughts two weeks ago at the uh, February 15th Board of Education meeting. Um, and I'm going to reiterate them tonight. Uh, the students and staff of Washington County Public Schools truly deserve a fully funded budget that fully staffs our schools and meets the needs of our students. And as was just mentioned in the BARC presentation, that the budget doesn't even keep up with inflation. Your budget is so lean, it doesn't keep up with what is expected to be the, uh, the inflationary numbers uh, coming our way. So I use an analogy sometimes talking about education and funding, not just here in Washington County, but throughout the state that if we don't maintain our vehicles, if we drive on bad tires, it's very likely we're going to have a breakdown or worse, we're going to have an accident. It's inevitable. Driving on bad tires is going to lead to something bad. Due to underfunding, WCPS has been driving on bad tires. You do everything you can do with the meager dollars you get. But there's only so much you can do. An accident in the form of a staffing crisis, issues with our facilities, as an earlier comment brought up, now is the time to act. We can't afford deferred maintenance and bald tires any longer. So I've shared with you a, a bulleted list. Our budget needs to include enough teachers so that elementary students aren't in classes of 26, 28, 30, maybe even more. That's not the norm in every room, but 28 kids in a kindergarten class is too many. We definitely need more counselors and social workers. A full-time counselor in every building should be the norm nationwide, especially here in Washington County where we care about our kids. Definitely more specialists to meet the needs of our kids enrichment and enhancement opportunities for small groups, for individuals, and team teaching. Definitely enrichment programs within the school day, but also outside the school day. We can be offering more. We saw it this summer where we got creative and had all sorts of activities to engage kids. We need to enhance that. Definitely improved and enhanced wraparound services. Community schools, 
true community schools with those wraparound services. They partner with community agencies and organizations. They've proven to be effective. The wraparound services meet the needs of our students, but also their families in the community at large. An appropriately staffed welcome center. I, I just heard that there have been a few changes made to that welcome center. We definitely need more than a department of one for our welcome center that, that meets the needs of our EL students and their families as they transition to Washington County Public Schools. I said it two weeks ago, school resource officers, they're important, they're essential in our community, and funding for the SROs has to be part of the county's public safety budget, not the WCPS general fund budget. The Board of County Commissioners can fund the SROs as is done in over 20 counties throughout Maryland. Wages for ESPs, we heard a reference to that, need to be truly living wages because current WCPS compensation levels struggle to compete with other employers in our region. Positions that are open now will remain unfilled. I worry staff will leave and students' needs will go unmet. And enhanced salaries for the educators who are already steps behind. The COLA of 1% or 1.5% was the best WCBOE could do because we were underfunded. We need to do better than that. We will lose qualified educators to neighboring jurisdictions whose salaries <coughs> outpace those of WCPS. Education is a much better investment than incarceration or rehabilitation. So the students and staff of WCPS deserve a robust, fully funded budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Mr. Becker is the only person who I have registered. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during the hearing? Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Ashley McCusker. Ms. McCusker, are you representing a group? What? Are you talking no, individually no, no, no. or representing Just a group? Just myself. Okay, so I'll do three minutes? Yep. Thanks. Um, it won't take that long, so okay. it should be fine. Um, from listening to the last meeting, I know you guys were wanting more counselors for our children. I think this would be a great idea, but I also know we Can you are... speak up a little bit more? Yeah. Please. Sorry. Can I skew this? Is Thank that you. better? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. So um, from listening at the last meeting, I know you guys were wanting to get more counselors for our children. I think this will be a great idea, but I also know we are having trouble with funding. Um, I'm hoping to bring you a solution or at least something you can look in to see if it could be of help. I think we can all agree that the need for extra counselors are mostly due to the hardship caused by COVID. Since this is an issue directly related to COVID, would you be able to use some of the COVID funding on a, con on a contract basis to hire a few new extra counselors? I'm not saying that this is a long-term solution, but I do think it's something that could be looked into and maybe help until we can figure out a long-term solution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCusker. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? No? Okay, then we will call adjournment on the public hearing and we will reconvene our business meeting. Next on our agenda this evening is old business. First item is the Board of Education's fiscal year 2023 draft budget. Good evening, gentlemen. <coughs> us. Mr. Pru, our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. David Brandenburg, the Executive Director of Finance, and Mr. Eric Sisler, Budget and Finance Manager. So board members, I've asked staff <clears throat> to bring forward some ideas based on our discussion during the uh, budget work session and during the last board meeting. Um, I think some things have come to, to light since uh, my presentation of the budget. And one of those is a recommended first motion for your consideration. We have the opportunity to take a pair of professional position and um, 
at minimum cost, move that into a full-time counseling position, and we're recommending your consideration of that. We have a pass-through of preschool money. This is money that comes out of our maintenance of effort money that's got to go to a private preschool program. It's part of Kerwin and a new initiative this year. And um, that's just a pass-through of money. And another item is we're working with Meredith on our contractual services with Meredith, so that's an item we'd like for you to consider. Staff is also has two other potential recommended motions as well as any other considerations the board might have. One of those would be the addition of five social workers. Actually, uh, several of these positions would come out of ESSER funding, much like the um, young lady just mentioned, and could be added to the budget and continue to do ESSER for a couple years if you chose to do that. The other is four additional English language learner positions, two of which exist in the ESSER funding to which we're requesting consideration uh, to be added to the budget as our numbers uh, exceed record all-time highs for English language learners. The last item we have is consideration um, of approximately 575,000. That number could be much higher um, as a potential add to our resource pool uh, for the potential of uh, considering additional raises beyond those that I've dedicated in the budget that I've recommended to you which was the majority of the budget. We really tried to focus on that, as Mr. Becker indicated. Uh, two years ago, the entire salary increase for each of the employee bargaining groups was 1%. We were not able to fund a step, and we didn't even keep pace with inflation. Last year, I believe it was one and a quarter percent and no step. And obviously, again, we put a high priority on this. There's also language that costs money, uh, that if we had additional resources in the resource pool, uh, that could be considered as a possibility. So staff's here tonight to answer any questions you have. These are three possible recommendations for your consideration. Um, and obviously it could be altered any way you cho choose to do so uh, or ignored or not made at all and, and or any other item of the budget that you would wish to change. Uh, this would be the time to, to bring that up for the draft budget. And with that, I'll just see if staff have anything else to share or, or any other questions or comments we'll be glad to answer. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Yes, Mr. 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 Proof, could you explain to people that don't know what ESSER funding is, where it comes from, and how long we'll have that funding? So the ESSER funding, uh, currently we're working through ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. So uh, ESSER 2 uh, stemmed out of the last stimulus bill that was uh, done under the Trump administration. Uh, ESSER 3 is money stemming from the ARP, American Recovery Plan funding, uh, funded under the Biden administration. Uh, those are federal dollars that are for COVID relief. Uh, those funds have to be expended by September 30th of 2024, so just the start of fiscal year 25. Thank you. There are other stipulations, but more or less, you know, we, we have some flexibility with how we use those funds, uh, more flexibility with the ESSER three funds. There's a portion that has to be dedicated specifically to student uh, growth, student education. Uh, another portion of it can be used for, for nearly any project. But it's limit for a limited time. It is. Thank you. Bill, just building on that, can, um, could you address Ms. McCuster's comments? Are, are we doing something similar to what she's requesting? Or? So we currently have uh, six counselors in counselors slash social workers in the ESSER funding. Um, three of which are likely, you know, those that came over already under the superintendent's draft budget, which is. Uh, your draft budget, we added, we talked about adding three counselors, but allowing student services and counseling department to determine whether they wanted to use those three counselors uh, that are currently funded as ESSER and permanently fund them under the general fund, or whether they felt that there was additional need. So the likelihood is the three positions that are currently in ESSER will be made permanent under the general fund. With the second recommendation you have in front of you tonight, which is five social workers, we currently have three social workers funded through the ESSER funding. They serve five different schools. One is full-time at one school. The other two are part-time at splitting four different schools. Uh, this recommendation would solidify the three positions in ESSER in the general fund, make them permanent, and add two more so those social workers could work full-time at a single school. And those are benefited WCPS employees. That's correct. And, but we also do have contractual services. Do we outsource any of our 
counseling? We do, mostly along the lines more of uh, mental health, more of psychology services. I think at the last meeting, uh, we had a, uh, a consent agenda item to renew uh, bids with various uh, mental health agencies to provide support services to our students. And I know we do have some psychologists will even come into the school, correct, and, and have appointments in, no. on, on, on premise. Okay. And we have a cadre of school psychologists as well that, that also provide various services. <laughs> I, I would say also, Mr. Bickford, to that question, also in recommendation two is the 4EL positions. Uh, maybe I'll just roll back to that. Um, we have two English learner positions currently in ESSER. We would solidify those in the general fund is in addition to adding two more. On September 30th, which is the time we take the count for the funding for the future year, we recorded, I believe the number was 614 English learning students. We're currently at 700 or slightly above 700, so we've had a 14% growth in the year for students that need EL services. Since September 30th. Since right? September 30th. And that's how many different languages? Uh, I used to say 40 couple, but I think now we're starting to say 51 or two. Um, Paul is not yeah, in, so Paul I think you're right. So she, she would probably know. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing, you know, maybe it's Mrs. McCusker's uh, comment. I mean, we could roll these into the general fund if the board chose to do that. That would solidify these permanently. We also could continue to hire for the next two years positions out of the grant funding, but we'd have to recognize the potential of those being eliminated at some point. Some of these grant funded positions were but, uh, positions that I had placed in our budget two years ago and last year that didn't make the budget because of funding and that's why we pushed them over into ESSER. I think this will be an opportune time to try to make some of these more permanent. But again, we could expand and maintain the ones in ESSER, maybe the exact positions potentially move into the budget, but you could maintain additional positions to ESSER. But by September 2024, they would have to be absorbed in a future budget, which I don't see the money between now and then to do that necessarily, but it's always possible. Um, or we'd have to recognize the potential of them being eliminated. Mrs. Williams. Yes, yeah, so, because I would highly recommend us doing that because right now with our achievement gap being so large, we want to try to close that gap. And if we would have those positions in there, that would give us more of an opportunity to close that in the first couple years, and maybe we wouldn't need those um, in the long term. But to not do anything extra now when we definitely have that gap that it's so large, and I have been saying this for a long time, I'd like to see more teachers added to the, the budget. I'd like to see more pair pros added to the budget because this is the only way that we're gonna get these, this learning gap closed. I, I, I get it that there's social workers and everything else that's needed, but the ones that are actually working firsthand with a student all day long is a teacher and a parapro. And I think just for me not being a teacher and looking at from the outside mm -hmm. in, I would rather see more hands-on, one-on-one in the classroom <laughs> than someone that's coming in and pulling some child out every once in a while to work with them. It's just my opinion. I just feel like we, we just need more of that in there. But I, I'm really concerned about not having, you know, social worker in every school. I think you said there was part-time social workers. Is that correct in some schools? A lot of schools wouldn't have a social worker at all, but the schools that we're describing are, are those that we believe need full-time social work. Because we are, we are way behind right now. And I think we need to do everything we can and throw as much of it, and if that's money that's gonna go away in a couple of years, at least let's use it now and try to get more people in the classrooms, get them in there. That's just my opinion. So uh, I'd like to see more of that. Mr. Staff. Uh, Mr. Gefford is, is partially right. Um, we could use more staff. We have pair pro uh, positions open, but we don't have anybody to fill them because nobody's coming forth to uh, take those positions. So I don't know how you get more pair pros when there aren't any bodies. When I visited Bester Elementary, that was one of the things expressed to me by uh, uh, Dr. Williamson, uh, the fact that uh, when I asked her about pair pros, she said we could use more, but she said there's nobody willing to work. So that is a problem. Uh, but these kids, 
what I observed that day, and I'm sure it, it, it exists in other elementary schools, some of the things that I saw that day, believe me, we need counselors, we need social workers. These kids, some of these kids are coming to school today with situations that that are far worse than I ever uh, faced. I do remember having t taught high school one day. I had a uh, young man who uh, couldn't stay awake in class. It might have been because he had a boring teacher named Stouffer. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I talked to him one day and I, I privately, and I said to him, why, what, what's your problem staying awake? And he said, well, he said, I'm hungry. And I said, oh. Long story short, he went on to tell me that in his home, uh, not everybody ate dinner on the same night. There were apparently six people in the family, and on one night, uh, the one parent and two kids ate, and the next night, the other parent and two other kids ate. They didn't eat, all eat uh, dinner, and that was years ago. So I can't imagine uh, the way it is now. Uh, I trust the guidance of the superintendent. Uh, he works with this day, day in, day out, uh, as does staff. Uh, we're really part-timers here. And you're, and you're right, Mike, you know, we could use more teachers and so forth. But if we get more staff, we gotta have the money to pay for them. And that comes out of the general budget, and that comes from the people downtown. So that's all I'll say. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Mr. Gupta. And so if we were to uh, move, uh, if we were to get new social workers uh, positions and move them off our ESSER funds um, and not hire more uh, social workers or counselors uh, with the um, ESSER money that we have, where else would that ESSER money go? Well, the ESSER funds, like most federal funds, you have opportunities to submit amendments. So we would submit amendments. We could submit amendments for additional teaching staff or IAs if we could get those. Again, we'd have to recognize it'd only be for two years. As Mr. Pru indicated, ESSER three in particular has um, a significant portion of its dedicated, 11 million is dedicated to student achievement. Uh, that is gonna run our summer schools for the next three summers. That'll pretty much eat up what we've already taken out of that money. Um, plus some additional tutors and people that we have in that 11 million. One of the advantages of the ESSER three funding is we can use a lot of that towards construction. Construction costs in some cases have gone up substantially. Most cases have gone up substantially. Some of our bids have been probably 50% higher than what we'd anticipated them being. So they're gonna actually create a bridge for us right now um, with a lack of CIP funding to address a variety of um, projects that we have, HVAC project, roof projects, um, uh, boiler projects, electrical construction projects, um, those types of things. So we could reallocate those funds either for staffing, for materials, for, in the case of ESSER three, beyond that, that's gotta be committed directly to student instruction, could be committed towards construction. Maintenance. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just kind of want to reiterate reiterate what uh, Mr. Gesford said. I, I have said it before that uh, I personally would like to see more teachers in the classroom. Um, I certainly appreciate uh, the work social workers and school psychologists do. I used to teach students with emotional disabilities and uh, they, they provide a very high value to uh, a lot of students. But I, I do agree with Mr. Gesford that um, I, I personally want to see more teachers in the classroom. I think that is where the, the most critical need is. Um, if, if a teacher is able to be in front of 20 students rather than 30 students, and obviously that's, that, that number would be incredible if we could get it there, but um, you know that it makes it easier for the teacher to maintain the classroom. It makes it easier for the teacher to help all of the kids instead of some of the kids because there's only so much time in a class period anyway. Um, teachers just can't get to the kids to help them. So I think the most critical need is more teachers, more, more people in front of the kids in the classroom. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of times we also know that if a kid is doing better in the classroom, a lot of those behaviors and, and things that the school psychologists, school social workers would need to work on would also, you know, be help from that as well. So I do agree with Mr. Gesford. Um, I, I was really hoping to see more 
people in the classroom even and and again I know it's easier said than done because you know we just heard from a, a young lady talking about how overcrowded her school was you know you also have to find a place to put the teachers too so it's uh, it's not easy I, I, I understand that and your staff does a heck of a lot of work to, to put this together but um, for me my priority would be putting more pe more teachers more adults in the classroom in front of the kids so um, I, I was kind of hoping to see that. Again, I mean, that would be up to the board. For, right. You know, right. Motion and action. You will certainly abide by your wishes. Any further discussion? Dr. Sackmeyer. It is a challenge, and I have to agree with both of you. We do need more teachers, but you can't teach a kid who is challenged beyond the confines of the classroom. So we need both. We need more teachers. But we also need that support staff so that the kid is ready to learn. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Um, I've made my feelings known with regard to the need for counselors. Um, students can't learn when they're hungry, and they certainly can't learn <laughs> when they're hurting emotionally. And um, I think we have a lot of children who are hurting emotionally in our schools and they need the support that counselors can provide them. Um, I've spoken before, I think it's important that we have a counselor in each of our elementary schools. Um, I know it's been said that um, counselors are assigned based on the, the enrollment of a school and a school with a very large or low enrollment doesn't necessarily require a full-time counselor and that a counselor nearby could get there in a hurry well that's assuming that that counselor is responding to some type of crisis and there are things that that occur that might not be considered a crisis but things happen during the course of a day that that needs uh, that would need to be addressed by someone other than the classroom teacher and that counselor is able to do that Additionally, I know having worked in an elementary school, uh, the services that a counselor can provide, there are groups, small groups of students that can work together um, uh, on different needs and situations. Um, now back, back when I was teaching fourth grade, uh, some of the things were the loss of a pet or a divorce. Those were, those were things that were certainly saddening and, and certainly things that children needed support for, but I, I fear that kids are dealing with um, huger issues and, they, and we really, truly need someone um, in those elementary schools every day, all day. That, that's my feeling. So if there's no more discussion, do we have well, I, a I motion? I have a question. Do we have, I mean, where are we right now with counselors in each of the elementary schools? Do we have full-time ones there, or do we have? I think we're down to five schools that have part-time counselors. We actually have a half-time counselor that is only employed half-time. Uh, I could have this wrong, but I think I'm pretty close to this. And then we have two full-time counselors that split between four schools. So they're there half the time, um, sometimes two days, three days, uh, or every other day uh, type arrangements. Try our smaller schools. You know, our smaller schools are a great gift. Our smaller schools are also very challenging to staff. Um, you know, full-time counselor, 150 students, and uh, we'll have a full-time counselor for 400 students. So it may be that if someone can't even get to students, if they're one to 400, and the one to 150 would be outstanding and excellent, then those children will have somebody readily available to them while somebody else doesn't have somebody. It works that way too with our um, teaching class ratios. You know, we have a couple, a couple classes that I'm aware of that are approaching 30 or around 30 uh, students. I think we have one class, well, I can think of a school that was in this week, uh, that has a class with 30 couple in the classroom. We hired an IA. We finally were able to get an IA to support that teacher. It's an excellent teacher. Uh, but in those small schools, again, if you have 28, you get an extra teacher. There's two rounds. It goes to 14 and 14. You know, that's better than a lot of our Title I's, far better than a lot of our Title I schools. So it just makes it challenging 
uh, with our small schools. But we certainly move staff around. Contingency positions are something we don't have built into our budget right now. Do you know? So normally we, we put as many as five contingency positions in our budget. Normally they're allocated to elementary schools in the fall. Um, if allocated at all, sometimes we haven't needed to allocate them, but sometimes you're just in that school and everybody that enrolls a third grader. Of all grades, we can't get one more third grader and everybody walks through the door as a third grader. <laughs> and class size gives 26 and then two more add and it's 27 and two more add and it's 28. And pretty soon it's you know larger and larger. So um, contingency positions be one way to add teaching positions to the budget and allow flexibility to see what type of movement we're going to have. We're going to come out of the pandemic. Will we have students come back from homeschooling that have been to homeschooling? Um, our enrollment is actually down. Uh, Mr. Pru, you might be able to help me with numbers, but over the last couple of years, uh, we've actually had, you know, flat to declining enrollment, particularly elementary has been declining. You know, the bubble went through middle school, moving into high school. Uh, we don't know what next year's kindergarten is going to bring necessarily. We could have a very large kindergarten, but birth rates don't seem to indicate that. But again, who's going to be on homeschooling? Who's going to return to school next year? We could have a big swing in our enrollment. Um, you know, it would be hard to predict. So something like contingency positions, we're putting every dollar we can towards salary. And that's why we just didn't create any additional positions beyond that. But contingency positions would be an excellent addition to the budget if they'd be funded. Mrs. Williams, I'd like to make a motion that we have uh, a counselor in every elementary school. That would be my motion. I, I did not prepare to to address that, but um, I will. I would like to make a motion that we we adjust the budget that every elementary school has a counselor full time. Full -time. I'll second that. Try to write this down. You're amending every elementary school to have a full time counselor. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second by Mr. Bickford to amend the fiscal year 2023 draft budget. That, that actually won't change the budget unless you're changing the number of positions. You can make that motion as a directive to staff to have a full-time counselor in every, every school. We could do that now with existing resources. We would do that by taking from somebody that has more than one counselor. You understand how it's not a... I don't know uh, that that's what they want to do. Well, my suggestion is it's not... <laughs> there's no place in the budget that I open up that says a counselor in every building. You see what I'm saying? This this is a kind of a directive to staff to have a counselor in every building. So we have we enough counselors that I could have a counselor in every building under the current budget. But it would mean, I don't mean it's a bad way, it's just say it in fact, we would pull counselors. So if a school had one and a half counselors, I might take a half-time counselor, put them with another position to make that full-time within this building. That So related to the budget would be the additional staff unless you're allowing us to do that as well, unless you're allowing us to move staff. And I don't want I don't to speak to Mr. Gesford's intent, but I don't think that he was wanting to reduce the number right. of elementary no. counselors by reconfiguring. He wants correct. to add, add additional. additional. So, so earlier in the discussion when you said that you had like one and a half, I don't want that one and a half to disappear just to help cover another school. I would like additional coverage for every school to have what they have now plus up to a full-time counselor in elementary schools. Right. So I'm not trying to be difficult, just trying to understand the budget part of it. We, we, we have three we have three additional counseling positions that were in my draft budget that you adopted. Those are three additional to the general fund budget. We do have three counselors currently employed that are funded through ESSER. So Part of the counseling department's request has been to make those more full-time, transfer those positions into the general fund so we can count on them for the future. However, with those three positions that we added to the general fund, we can make these two other schools that are half-time, I might even need another half. Um, it seemed like we pulled the other half from somewhere else. I think I just need two full-time counselors to make us full. 
I'm just saying from a budget standpoint, I need you to add a number to this, or I can do it within the three, but I'd leave those other three in ESSER. When ESSER runs out, unless a future superintendent can pull them over in the next couple of years, right. those positions would need to be cut. Um, the other possibility would be the five social workers we had in here, you could change that motion to be two more counselors. I did see Ms. Huffer walk in, which I think she could probably answer everything right off the top of her head. There she is. Please join us. Lucky you. Right? How, how many count, how many elementary counselors total are there right I'm now? I'm going to see if Ms. Huffer. So I'll see. Sure. She might not be able to answer that. Um, uh, like 26, 27. Um, right now, we currently have two uh, full-time counselors who split four schools. And then we have a part-time counselor at the elementary level at Greenbrier. All other schools have a full-time counselor or two. Cascade has a full-time? They have a split position between Cascade and Potomac Heights currently. Potomac Heights. But the redefinition, can I speak to that? Of the one, the redefinition of the yeah. one para position from my department would potentially provide a full-time counselor at two of those elementary schools and then dropping that down to one split and then still the part-time at Greenbrier. So we're changing that IA to a counseling position. So that's going to give uh, Ms. Huffer, you know, full, full position. So she just takes, you know, two of those schools, she can make full-time and full-time. So with one more position, one and a, one and a half, half one and more a half positions, positions, we can make all those full-time. Yes. But and again, I have three already in the budget. We could take it within that, but it would mean cutting some that we have funded out of ESSER. Or you could add another one and a half position. Your motion could be add an additional one and a half counselors to the budget uh, to ensure that we have one full time counselor in every elementary school. That's what I would like. Would, would that be correct? One and a half would make us whole? No, not out of ESSER. Not out of the budget. I'm not going to speak for Ms. Huffer, but I am going to advocate for the department because we worked on this, and I know it disagrees with where the board is, we really need about 10 or 15 more counseling positions so that we can support all those schools that need resources and then have the benefit to be able to supply a full-time counselor to our smallest schools. Because I'm trying to advocate for the team who's describing to me our, we still have great needs that are not at our smallest schools. We absolutely have the need for a full-time counselor at every school. But we have greater needs, correct me if I'm wrong, no, you're correct. greater yeah. needs at other schools that already have full-time counselors. Just the <clears throat> needs are at those other schools based on the number of staff that we have. So then are you asking us to uh, amend that and add additional, like one and a half, or add another half to those ones that are already one and a half to make them two? I guess I, I you know, in a... <laughs> In a budget that we don't even know is going to be funded, it's just hard to say, Mr. Gusford. We've tried to be reasonable with the budget. Again, we've tried to funnel as many resources towards salary after a 1%, 1 to quarter percent raise. And, you know, I'll be watching this from my retirement chair, but this school system, this school system will be short staffed this September. And next September, a year away from this September, we will be short more staff. And if we do not address this, teachers, administrators, and ESP, this will be a crisis. It is absolutely no different, and we all value our police officers and our firefighters, but this situation is no different. It is as large a crisis in a, you know, I'm a capitalist, and I'm a firm believer in the law of supply and demand. The demand for teachers is going to skyrocket with Kerwin. The, the supply of teachers has been diminishing for the last five, ten years substantially and right now with the change in the economy ESP has seen a big significant change and I know people don't like to support administrators but I'm telling you there's a war for administrators people are fighting over top quality leadership and to get those things you've got to attract people and we got to figure out a way to do that no one wants their child in a class of 28 or 30 but I can guarantee you no one in this room or anybody listening to me tonight once their child in a class of 30, taught by a non-certified, you know, calculus teacher, whatever. And it's going to come to that real quick if we don't keep up with pay and benefits. And it's just law of supply and demand. And that's where we are with the police officers. It's a law of supply and demand. I was at the state of the city early this morning. 
the mayor mentioned I didn't think they were down this many but she mentioned they were down 30 police officers in the city the city's gonna have to raise pay to attract police officers and benefits or whatever it's a crisis we will have that same crisis if we don't keep pace so again back to the, the other comment I'm just trying to advocate for staff to sure. put resources where they need them most how many how many schools elementary schools that do we have one and a half counselors at right now we have none that have one and a half counselors we have several that have two counselors at them we have, where, did, where did the one and a half come from because we have a part-time position at one of our elementary schools okay so I'd like to I don't know I'll pull that motion back off and redo the motion that there is one full-time counselor in each school and any school that has the half am I correct half at elementary make level, an impulse yes. at elementary yes one and a half additional counselors beyond what we have right now would do that correct so you want to to amend so that, the draft budget to add one and a half yeah. counselors is yeah. that what I'm hearing beyond we would have to pass these order. amendments too in order to make that work you, you could just go ahead and start passing these amendments staff can give you a budgetary figure here as we go Pretty okay close. so we're Ms. Okay. mr. Gessler your amendment to the budget is to add one and a half counselors to ensure an L a counselor at every elementary a full-time counselor at every elementary am I understanding that yes Is there any further discussion? Dr. Zetmeyer. I think it's easy for us to say we have a quick fix, but the person in this room who has a quick fix and knows how to best use the resources is sitting in front of us. And for us to prescribe so resolutely what we feel should be done tonight doesn't make sense when the person who knows how the resources should be allocated is sitting here. Does that make sense? I appreciate what you're saying, Dr. Zetmeyer, but we've had counselors come before us, we've had teachers come before us, we need and it. they're the people who are actually dealing with these uh -huh. students, and that's what I'm hearing. No disrespect. I, I have a problem with adding. Mike's right. We need more. Absolutely. But where they go should be left up to the department. No disrespect to that, this young lady down here, but I think that's... I'm with Melissa. I think we've we've heard enough, and as a as a school board, I'd like to see that action taken. That every school has it. A counselor. A full counselor. Elementary. Everybody has it. Like this goes against the original premise that we need more people to stop the learning gap. So, are you moving away from that? No, I'm not moving. I'd I'd like to add more. But, you know, and I think there will probably be more people come back into the system now that we've taken the mask off, and I think parents are going to start letting the kids come back to school, and I think parents are going to go back to work, and I think we're going to have more people that are going to want to come back to work. That's just my feeling. But one step at a time. But, yes, I would love to see more teachers and more parapros. I think they're going to have more. I think if, you know, who knows? With how the budget works out. I don't think so, there's anybody so sitting keep, up here that would Let's keep right. the discussion to the motion, yes. and the yeah. motion is to add one and a half counselors to ensure that we have a full time counselor at every elementary school. Mrs. Williams, if for that, just so we can keep the running tab here. Yep, so, Mrs. Williams, just uh, for the board members, uh, Eric is telling me that that uh, add to the budget is $127,917. One hundred. Yeah. One twenty-seven nine seventeen. And and to be so, I don't want to muddy the water. Um, the first slide you have on the screen includes the redeployment that Ms. Hopper talked about, which and, and Dr. Michael has mentioned, which is taking a position that's vacant, which is a paraprofessional within the counseling department, and converting it to a full-time counselor. So two and a half counselors are needed to make a full-time counselor at every elementary school. One is this redeployment. 
So whether you approve that motion as it's written on your documents and shown on the screen in full or only do this portion of the motion, you, that needs to be included. I'm prepared to make these motions. So. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Then we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? Okay, so we have unanimous student <coughs> member concurs. And I'm happy to work through these motions if we want to get those talked through. You want me to do that, Madam President? I am ready for the next amendment motion if there Should, is one. May, may I ask a question now? About depends on what your question is. Well, <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Michael about uh, this isn't going to draw anybody from the ESOL positions, right, affect that, just adding the counselors and stuff. From EL positions? Yeah. I said ESOL. That's the old term. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I mean, okay. I just wanted to make sure because having taught foreign students many, many times, the EL teachers, ESOL as we used yeah. to call them. You're jumping to these motions. Yeah, you're uh, I was back on the council. I'll make the motion that I can talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there another motion to be made? Uh, Madam President, I move to amend the FY 2023 draft budget to add a pass through expense for locally funded private preschools at a cost of $59,610. Redeploy one counseling paraprofessional to a school counselor position at a cost of $12,645 and increase the contracted school nursing services line by $297,545. Thank you, Mr. Bifford. Is there a second? <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Questions or discussion? So I just want to make clear, if this motion passes, we would have a full-time counselor at every elementary school? Last motion and the redeployment of this one position, we would have enough to have a full-time counselor at every elementary school. That's correct. Okay. Dr. Michael, do you believe that there is a need for more counselors than the two and a half that would be added uh, with the passing of the previous motion and this motion? I have confidence in staff who's telling me we would love to have a full-time counselor at every school. Um, with the limited resources we have so far, they have greater needs at other schools. That's the challenge. So I would probably say the answer to your question is there's probably a need for more counselors to address the needs of the other schools and then have enough staff available then to um, have full-time counselors at every elementary school. I am not at all opposed to having a full-time counselor in every school. I am kind of along the lines of Dr. Zentmeyer. I'm trying to, to allow you know, my staff and student services to direct staff where they most feel it's needed. Uh, so I'm on the same page, but I, I'm, I want to have those resources directed to where our greatest need is. And that's what we do with all of our, all of our various positions. We move them around, we do what we have to, we make it work with what we have. Uh, and, therein this, lies, and therein lies the problem is that we're continually not asking and advocating right. for what we need for our kids because it's always about what we think we can get and not about what we truly need. Right. And I'm so I would like to err on the side right. of doing what I know in my heart is the right thing to do for kids. And then it's to the commissioners. If they want to say no to the needs of the kids, then that's on them. That, with all respect, Dr. Michael, I know, I, I know exactly where your heart is. So. I, I, we're good. Confused. I, I absolutely want to see a full-time counselor in every school. Understand. I also want to see staff have the discretion to make sure we've directed resources, Those limited resources. as they are, to the places that benefit children the absolute most, and not, gotcha. you know, at the harm of anybody. So, just to clarify, how many more counselors do you believe should be added to address the concerns that staff has? and to have one counselor, or sorry, subtracting from if we had two and a half more counselors? I probably could not answer that question off the top of my head. I know we, I had staff develop a full plan, about $750,000 more to um, address student service needs. I kind of put forward how would we deal with particularly emotional behavioral issues that we're seeing. 
they developed the full plan. I mean, it's just got beyond what I thought I could ask the county commissioners or ask of the board to add to the budget. I mean, the other end of this thing, and I, I have no problem asking, if we're denied, then we got to come back in the budget and start cutting out all these expectations, which is all part of the process. Uh, we've done that before in June, but I think that's about what I'm trying to look at Ms. Huffer and trying to remember. We had about two and a half full sheets of items that, you know, if we were really trying to, and this wasn't a full address of everything, it'd be substantially higher than this. I do have one thing. I just want to make clarification. Marshall Street is is included in that, correct? Having a full time. Marshall Street has counselors, but more specifically, you know, resources and social workers. There's a, a variety got, of okay, needs. So they're, they're covered, and they got. I mean, I know it's different needs and all, but making sure that there's something there too, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say that they're part of that elementary group because I'm remembering the budget. I think we have elementary, middle, and high school counselors on three separate lines. Eric, or are they all we together? Used, we used to several years ago, but now they're all they're all lumped together. And how many total counselors are listed in the general fund? Sixty-eight with the three that we added this year. Say it again. Sixty-eight with the three that you've added this year. Okay. And this will add, this will add one and a half one and more, more, plus this transfer would be one more. This so, so Okay. So they have they have some they have kind of social worker. Their service is, is yeah, their service is a little different and they need a little bit more need to, okay. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion on Mr. Bickford's amendment to the draft budget, which is to add a pass-through expense for locally funded private preschools to redeploy one counseling paraprofessional to a school counselor position and to increase the contracted school nursing service line. I, I just want to clarify one thing. The $750,000 figure you mentioned, what is the number of counselors uh, in that $750,000? that document with me, Helen. I would either. Give a rough estimate of what that would be. Just so do your math. So the plan that, that the student service team developed, I know there's professional development, there were summer days, there was a variety of things. You recall how many counselors, additional counselors were in that budget? For you should talk into the mic because she's, yeah. she's interpreting you. Sorry. For the most recent ask okay. that um, I asked you all to look at. There were um, three more to reduce the numbers at some of the other schools. Sorry. Uh, there were three more additional counselors to reduce the number at some of the schools and a look at some of the social work positions to and, address the support. And There's, that, that wouldn't have put full-time counselors at our smallest schools? No. No. So that was in the later part of the ask, so that would have probably been additional six positions. Um, if we're looking at all of that total with adding counselors to all the elementary schools. Right. So at this but point, those weren't the one and a half, excuse me, sorry. the one and a half and this one would be two and a half. So I think we're looking at three and a half more positions yes. beyond what's been recommended so far would. And that would be like bare minimum for some of the higher you know, volume at schools. We have some schools that are sitting at six, 700 students with one counselor currently and a lot of needs. Um, those schools do have a social worker there, but there's still a lot of needs that are addressed differently by counselors and social workers based on their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. What's our counselor resource pool look like? Currently, like in Frontline, um, probably about six, seven counselors currently, but the graduation, you know, counselors don't graduate till May. So based on that and um, talking with HR about recruitment for programs that are close. I know counselors don't graduate until May. They're completing their internships right now, so Got they're it. not certified so until May. Mm -hmm. And they're guaranteed a job or you're looking at? Oh, I don't know that they're guaranteed a job. <laughs> they're guaranteed graduation. They'll be completing their programs at that point in time. Got it. So, so you're sort of looking ahead to what's going to be out there. Correct. So possibly higher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think we're good to vote. Is there, any, I do. Is there any further? Yep, we, we're in discussion. Is there any further discussion? Do you want to hear the motion one more time? Please. Motion one more time. Okay. 
motion is to amend the fiscal year 2023 draft budget to add a pass-through expense for locally funded private preschools and redeploy one counseling paraprofessional to a school counselor position and increase the contracted school nursing services line. Mrs. Williams, if I may, just a quick comment. Uh, for those that are listening, those in the audience, the, the pre-K pass-through expenses, uh, the school systems and private pre-K providers are now being funded uh, through the Kerwin legislation for children they have in pre-K programs. At the superintendent's recommended budget, we added a pass-through expense for the state share of the funding. So the state government and local governments are now funding not only public pre-K but also private pre-K programs. So we have uh, one organization locally who had students during the current school year, we receive state funding for that agency. It comes to us, and then we then share it with the local uh, agency. We also have to share the local portion of the Kerwin funding on pre-K with those agencies when they have students. So that is the, what's being presented here in front of you tonight, uh, and that comes out of the school district's maintenance of effort funding from the county government. So that's Monday, actually, that we will be out that we had this year that we won't have next year, just for clarification. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion? Right, we have seven affirmative. Student member concurs. Motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Madam President, I move to amend the FY 2023 draft budget to add five social worker positions at a cost of $416,483 and add four English learner teacher positions at a cost of $323,659. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Jantmeyer. Discussion? Tanisha. Oh, go ahead. Um, so if we were to add five more counselors um, through an amendment to this motion, would we be meeting the um, uh, the wants of WCPS in terms of counselors? I don't think you'd be meeting the wants. I think what I heard was you'd be meeting the minimum, um, kind of a good starting point, where staff would feel like they've met the needs of other children in other schools before they would have allocated resources of a full-time counselor in some of the smallest schools. So in that case, we would be meeting what the staff would want. We would be getting um, one full-time counselor at all of the schools, at all the elementary schools, um, and we would be meeting um, a good starting point for WCPS in terms of counselors. That's correct. So I have a question. So looking at the, the numbers that we're talking about here and uh, plus the other increase to the resource pool that we're talking about. Um, we're looking at a little less than $1.7 million that we just added to the budget, plus the, what do we say, it was about 128000 for the extra school counselors. What else would, I mean, in my head, it just seems like we would need to cut something by $128,000 since this stuff was already prepared for. Do we need to look at cutting maybe the amount of money we're putting in that resource pool by 575 or maybe well, making all, only four all social these, workers? All these draft motions are strictly yours, 100% to look at. You could turn all three of them down, uh, except for the pass-through money is probably the only thing we absolutely would have to do. We could just say do that out of the current existing resources. We could certainly do that. All these are just optional motions, but if they're, they're recommendations of staff that you at least consider these. Um, I mean, in the end, we, let's hope the county commissioners fund all this and it'd be great if they would volunteer to even fund more. We know that you were only able to give a 1% raise two years ago when we gave a step and a percent to our staff. We know you were only able to give a one and a quarter percent last year when we gave a step and a 1% raise to our, to our staff. I don't know if there well could be a county uh, shortage of staff members. I just know my business here and I know we have a shortage and I know that shortage is gonna grow. So I think that's why we're putting a lot of our effort towards these resource pools. But it'd be great if the county commissioners funded this and said, hey, you know, we, 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 wanna, we wanna have 
a solid school system where every student has a certified teacher in front of them, a well-qualified certified teacher. We want to attract the very best to Washington County. We want to have an IA for an IA job. We want to be able to make sure we fill the custodial positions, the bus driver positions, the administrative positions, and we want to support that effort. We need that, we need that type of help. I think, Mr. Evans, additionally, you could choose to do other reductions tonight if, if you wanted to. But over the last number of years, we've submitted the ask to the county and then reopened the budget after it's been approved once the commission, once we know exactly what the funding is from the county, and you can make your adjustments at that time in I, late I was May, thinking June. about that as Dr. Michael was talking to you. I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself there, so. So, to your point, Mr. Evans, with this additional one point, I think you said nine million? 1.7. 1.7, which is a little more than what the resource officers are costing us in our budget. Correct. So if the commissioners were to assume that responsibility, that would enable us to have these so things for our students, correct? I'm gonna have Mr. Sisler check my math. So a couple of things. The first motion that you had, I should, I should the first motion that staff presented was on the screen, which was uh, the one you just did, uh, the $370,000. How oh, that one? Potential amended. Yeah. That, that funding, that motion in essence is covered under maintenance of effort funding based on the latest allocation numbers we have from the state. Correct. So that, that amount should, should not, that line item should not be an issue. Right. Okay. The 120, I'll call it 128,000 for the additional council and a half, uh, plus this motion you have in front of you and the resource pool motion, and Eric, correct me, I'm hand sketching here, we're about 1.44 million. So that's 1.44 million above maintenance of effort, and the resource officers are approximately 1.2 million. So you're sort of there in the ballpark in terms of if that was your ask, to ask the commissioners to absorb resource officers out of public safety, allowing that money in the general fund to go to this, you're, you're within $200,000 roughly, that, you know, half a quarter million roughly of, of being full. Does that necessarily need to be in an amendment or would that be, obviously if we're that looking at another, additional funding, that, that would, would be, be a suggestion. motion. I don't know that or it would I'm, be an amendment to the what? budget. If, if we were to want to ask the commissioners to do that, that wouldn't be a budget amendment. That would just be a motion to make the ask, correct? Right, right. It would be a choice that they certainly could make. Um, and could be part of the presentation next week uh, for the joint meeting between the Board of Ed and the Board of County Commissioners. You know, I'll just say this. There isn't any fluff in this budget. If you wanted fluff in the budgets, uh, people should have made paid more attention, in my opinion, to the budgets of the last superintendent we had here. He bought this building because there was fluff, <laughs> as one county commissioner calls it, in the school budgets. And he over-dedicated, in my opinion, money to certain areas, and then when it wasn't used, he put it in the fund balance, built up the fund balance, and that's how we got this building. That isn't happening today. The county commissioners get our budget adjustments every month. As needed. They did as needed. They as needed. Every as month. Category. Cross category or adjustments needed. are only as needed. Yeah, it used to be quarterly, within didn't it? categories every yeah. month. Yeah, and so forth. And there's the balance is zero on those budget adjustments when they go from one place to another and so forth. I just wish some of these ideas had come out in our work session on the budget so that we could have worked these things out ahead of time and known about them and set a staff sitting here at the last talk. minute doing this. We did talk this. about these. Yeah. Well, well, I I know. Did talk we did talk about them. You know. All right. Is there any further discussion on Mr. Bickford's amendment, Dr. Zentmeyer's second? You need to be reminded of what that motion is. No. No. 
Do you mind if I just do you mind if I restate it? All right. Just just for my own assurance. I want to hear it. We're am amending the fiscal year 2023 draft budget to add five social worker positions and four English language, I'm sorry, English learner positions. All those in favor? Okay, we have seven affirmative votes and the student member <coughs> concurs. And I'll, since staff requested it, I'll add this one. Amend, uh, Madam President, I move to amend the FY 2023 draft budget to increase the resource pool in the amount of $575,000. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Well second. Who was that? Mr. Evans? Thank you. Okay, so discussion of this amendment to the budget or oh, <clears throat> questions. Ms. Murray. Mr. Crew, can you explain to the people that don't know what we mean by the resource pool? Or sure. the resource pool is the staff is the value of money set aside in the budget for contract negotiations for staff wages, uh, other benefits that may be uh, contractually uh, negotiated with our bargaining units as well as any increases that may be required for health insurance. Is there any further discussion? We need the money. We need to pay staff. We need to pay staff. We're we're in competition with a lot of other counties. They can cop over the mountain, take 20 minutes, teach in Frederick County. Go another 20 minutes, 25 minutes, they're in Montgomery County. Another 25 minutes, they're in Howard County. Those counties are all paying better money for a lot of things. When I was the AD here in this county, I was making, uh, at Williamsport High School, I taught for 40 some years, I was making 85,000. The athletic director at Middletown High School was making $108,000, $112,000 a year, had three assistant ADs and a secretary. So, you know, there's money across the mountain. Okay, are we ready for the vote? We're um, voting on the amendment to the fiscal year 2023 draft budget to increase the resource pool in the amount of $575,000. All those in favor? Right, we have seven affirmative votes. Student member concurs. By my count, we have passed four budget amendments unanimously with the student member concurring. Did we want to do any motion with regard to the SROs or do we just want to leave that as a, an ask I, I at the meeting? I want to make sure I understand. So these requests molded into the, your, our, our current draft budget will need how much extra funding? 1.44 million, I believe, if my math is right. Okay. Eric's, so con Eric's concurrent. Well, with the first one, above, above maintenance of effort. 1.44 above maintenance of effort. Of what they're required to give by law. Right. You increased by 1.8 tonight, but. 1.44 above maintenance of effort. So what kind of a percentage increase is that, Eric? Can you do that that quickly? What was our total county increase? That's really the number that I think stands out to me. I mean, earlier in the bar, there was a mention of the increase the in our um, I think the county overall budget, but the lift on the county side is still pretty minimal. It's our far our less increase. Inflation of the county with, with the additions or changes that were just made would be 4.41% increase. 4.41. 4, 4.41 4, 4. increase. Okay. So we would request of the commissioners in our joint meeting that's coming up that uh, they take on the role that they should be doing, which is paying for their sheriff's deputies complication there being they also need to pay for city police which we're gonna to have to figure out where they're gonna to to figure out could be a pass-through outside of maintenance of effort funding it. It, you know we, we can work that in, a, in an MOU I mean I, it's been something we've talked about every year to, to me this year seems like the year to th that they should do it in many ways because we saw the impact of 
they just raise salaries for their deputies and the city's challenged and going to have to pay more money for city police and here we are automatically having to raise salaries for their employees so why don't they just pay uh, do their do their duty and cover public safety and we'll handle education, education and mental health and behavior issues and all those things that come with it it, it is I mean the SRO system it's a great partnership they're fantastic officers so I understand why we ad probably adopted very early as we tend to do a, a, and, and brought them on board but I think it is time that they take over that expense it just makes sense to me I agree okay any other direction to stay up on the budget I don't think so no. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second item under old business is an amendment <coughs> to the school calendar for 2021-2022. Dr. Michael, did you want to speak to this before the motion? I, I can uh, briefly, I think, uh, I guess before the motion, I guess I, I can because I'm not making a motion or having That's a discussion. Right. So That's I guess right. I can. And you're not a board member. So right. So done. next next week was to be a two hour early dismissal. Uh, staff has recommended to the board um, to move that early dismissal to this Friday. Um, we think that would be appropriate. We have a, a fairly large convoy coming through uh, Washington County. We think it'll mostly affect uh, probably from Hewitt's Crossroads, between Clear Spring and Hewitt's Crossroads, as this convoy gets off 70 this Friday. But what happens with our buses, because many of our buses run four tiers, that area can be impacted by Jonathan Hager, Williams Sports, South High, North High, Clear Spring, a uh, couple different areas by the time they do first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier buses. And if we would get delayed anywhere in that mix, we suddenly could have long delays of returning students to home. We discussed trying to isolate what routes that would be, but since it's going to affect probably some portion of maybe a third of our schools or more, we're recommending to the board that they move the half day from next Friday, make that a full day of school, move it to this upcoming Friday. We know this is fairly short notice, but this would be no different than a um, snowy afternoon where we do a two and a half hour early dismissal. So our recommendation is to have a full day of school next Friday, and this Friday have a two and a half hour, two and a half hour early dismissal, not a two hour early dismissal, but a two and a half hour early dismissal, uh, hopefully to avoid any conflict uh, with bus routing for the afternoon. Staff's time would be for planning time, the same as it would be for, would have been for next Friday. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to amend the 2021-2022 school calendar previously amended and approved on December 21st, 2021 to move the scheduled two-hour early dismissal from March 11, 2022 to March 4th, 2022 and adjust the early dismissal time from two hours to two and one-half hours. Thank you, Ms. Rodin. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zenmeyer. Any questions? Any discussion? Well, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? Right, we have seven affirmative votes. Student member Kurz. Motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to new business. First item under consideration is the approval of this evening's consent agenda. Yeah, with us, Mr. Bakedell. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Tonight, I have one item for your review. This item was reviewed by our Purchasing Review Committee and is being recommended for approval. And Thank staff you, Mr. Is, is there a motion? Hello, Mr. Madam Mr. President. Uh, I'm watching Phineas and Ferb again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well. You were sleeping again, napping again, you know. Go ahead. I have a new puppy at home, so I'm like, I'm zoning out. Sorry. <laughs> you want to do the motion? No, go ahead. I'll just... Madam President, I move to approve the award for wireless access points to CDWG at a cost of $426,785. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any discussion, any questions for Mr. Baker? Yeah, the, the only question I have is um, looking at the matrix, the 
I mean, I, I would call it a rubric, the evaluation matrix. How, how are these scores given? I'm, I'm looking here and the, I see the cost of goods shows that, you know, the, the one that we're awarding to is given the best score, which I would imagine means the cheapest. But what is, what is that compared against? How does that look? And I don't know that this is an answer that could be given right now. Maybe it's uh, something no, we could talk about later. But It's based on the low points, uh, the low cost getting the highest score. And then each score is, each, um, each other additional bid is, is, gets a percentage based on how far they are from the low. Right, and but I do see an error there. It, that, 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 okay. The, Vendor two should have gotten the full points. Should have gotten 50 points. There was we were doing some evaluation on this early on, and that didn't get updated. So, the, although the scoring is the the cost of good scores are not correct, the low the 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 low cost didn't get the highest point. So his score actually would be 100. Um, okay. He would have gotten 100. Uh, he would have gotten the 50 points, and then 30 for the technical and 20 for the. Um, for the uh, nine one would be fifty points. Would be fifty points, correct? Okay, so that that completely makes sense. Yep. I, I apologize for that. What, I, I, what was it that you know if if they all had such horrible scores, you know? So what what are you comparing to be right. the good scores? But so that was just an error. And that, so essentially, the other two are really being compared off of vendor two. Then exactly. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then we're voting on the approval of the award for wireless access points to CDWG at a cost of $426,785. All those in favor? Okay, have a unanimous vote. Seven affirmative, and the student member confers. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Next, we have fiscal year 2022 budget adjustments with Mr. Brandenburg, our Executive Director of Finance. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Michael. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we do have some budget adjustments. Uh, this is the first time we've taken cross-category adjustments to the board this year because we do that on an as-needed basis. Uh, you'll see on the document that is provided, there's a, a top section uh, where we have some savings and the bottom section where we have some overruns. Uh, the savings come primarily from uh, indirect cost recovery related to the federal COVID relief grants, as well as savings from vacancies. And the bottom portion is mostly inflation and inflationary pressures, as well as covering some of those operating vacancies with overtime and a raise that the board approved in the substitute rate to, to attract more people to cover our classrooms. Uh, the, the bottom line is zero. And since these adjustments cross major categories of the budget, uh, upon your approval, we will take them to the county commissioners for approval. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to approve the. Yeah, I move to approve the proposed uh, FY22 budget adjustments as presented. Thank you, Mr. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any questions? Any discussion? Okay, then we're voting on the approval of the budget adjustments as presented. All those in favor? Okay, I have seven affirmative. Student member concurs. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Brandenburg. Thank you very much. Okay, our next item of new business is an MOU for advertising rights agreement with the Boonesboro Athletic Boosters, Inc. with Mr. Kerr presenting. Thank you, Mrs. Williams, members of the board. The matter before you, uh, as you just mentioned, is an advertising rights agreement with the Boonesboro Athletic Boosters, Incorporated. Uh, as board members may be aware, booster clubs often have uh, advertising signs for businesses as a fundraising venture. Uh, often those signs are on scoreboards, on uh, you know outfield fences, and so forth. Uh, this agreement sort of solidifies um, the ability for the Boonesboro Group to uh, find uh, businesses that are willing to donate 
uh, for the proceeds to go into the uh, athletic funds account to be used uh, for the purposes of supporting our student athletes. Uh, but it also protects the board and provides uh, some framework with which the Booster Club can do that. This is the first of such an agreement, and we would expect uh, moving forward upon your approval that we would reach out to other booster clubs across the county and establish similar frameworks with their organizations as well. Thank you. Is there a motion? Mrs. Williams, I move for the approval of the MOU of Advertising Rights for the Boonsport Athletic Boosters, Inc. Thank you, Mr. Is there a second? Second. For any discussion, any questions for Mr. Proof? Yes. I have one. It's on the second page, but it says page four. <laughs> uh, number uh, three at the top there. Uh, it says, in the event Babby does not have sufficient funds to pay for the cost of replacing or repairing the signage, the school board may seek expression of interest from other parties to pay the school board for the advertising right. Uh, does that mean staff is going to get involved in seeking advertisers? Um, I mean, so in, in theory, if you had a, if they had a, an advertising right with an organization, the sign was in disrepair, uh, and the booster organization did not have the funds, the, the, it's their obligation to post right. the signs, repair them, right. replace them as needed. If they did not have the, uh, the funds to replace that sign, we could remove it and potentially seek another advertiser uh, that would cover the board's cost for replacing that sign. Is that going to take a lot of staff time, you think? It's just a protection. It's a protection. I, you know, I, okay. I, I highly don't expect. I'm not having the funds. I highly expect okay. the booster clubs will have the funds. Just curious. I, I don't need to go door to door okay. seeking donations. Although maybe it would fund the budget. Sorry. Maybe what? Maybe it would fund the budget. <laughs> we can only hope. Any further discussion? Any other questions? All right, we're voting to approve the MOU of advertising rights for the Boonsboro Athletic Boosters Inc. All those in favor? All right, we have a unanimous vote, and the student member concurs. Thank you, Mr. Pru. Thank you. Our next item under new business is the first reading of proposed changes to policy DJ purchasing standards and the first reading of proposed exhibit DJ-E1 summary of procurement requirements and procedures and exhibit DJ-E2 minority business enterprise procedures for state funded public school construction products. Good evening, Mrs. Williams. What did I say? Did I say product? Oh, okay. Sorry. Good evening, President Williams, member of the board, Dr. Michael. The policy committee reviewed policy DJ and exhibits DJE1 and DJE2 at its public work session on February 10th, 2022 at the request of staff. Changes are being recommended to policy DJ in order to align the policy with current practice and state law. The committee is recommending that former administrative regulation DJR become new exhibit DJE1 because it provides a summary of information found in policy DJ. The committee is also recommending the adoption of new exhibit DJE2, which are procedures required under state law. The procedures were adopted by the Interagency Committee on School Construction to be utilized by local school systems as a condition for the receipt of state funds through the public school construction program. The committee has requested the Board of Education to approve the first reading of proposed changes to policy DJ and the adoption of new exhibits DJE1 and DJE2. Like a motion. Mm -hmm. Madam President, I move to approve the first reading of proposed changes to policy DJ entitled Purchasing Standards and the first reading of proposed exhibit DJE1 entitled Summary of Procurement Requirements and Procedures <coughs> and exhibit DJE2 entitled Minority Business Enterprise Procedures for State Funded Public School Construction Projects. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Discussion? I'd like to begin with a question on the recommended motion the last word 
under it's the exhibit DJ dash E2 the word is projects on my agenda it's products which is correct projects or products state funded public projects. school construction projects. It's, projects? it's projects okay yes. thank you just Any discussion about the policy, Mr. Evans? Yeah, I'm looking. I, I'm guessing it's just because it's this is just the draft. I see that on page three of six for policy DJ uh, under section four. There, we. I'm guessing it's just because we struck out section C. We're not missing uh, anything to replace that, right? That is just we're striking that out, and D will become C or. That's, that's correct. Okay. We are no longer delineating between non-professional services and professional services. We're just putting it together as service contracts mm -hmm. and not calling them out specifically. And then, so in Part D right underneath that, why did we add that last part unless the award is contracted to individuals or contractors that provide educational services and therapy relating to special ed students? What, why do we need to give the give them the ability to just go and make that decision with, you know, if it's cost more than $50,000, why do we add that part? Well, some of those contracted services are required under IEPs, and we don't put out bids for those. Okay. Thank you. And as you said, most of this is codified in state law and so forth. Correct. Yeah, I mean. We were just bringing our policy current with right. the requirements under the law. And then I do have one last question on the back page there, page six of six. Um, for uh, part H, the uh, environmentally preferred products, green products, I'm guessing this is something that we're probably just copying off of whatever state law is. Correct. Um, how, how are performance needs determined as well as uh, uh, what's reasonable? How do, I mean, those are, they're, they're, they're subjective words. How do you, uh, how, how do we go and follow that? <laughs> I can do this time. Yeah. Welcome back, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, most manufacturers um, provide us green products, you know, that they, so it, it really doesn't come down to, um, you know, uh, where we, we can't get something or something is much more. I mean, because of the school, every school system in Maryland has to buy green products, you know, our, our, the, um, the chemicals and, and things of that nature that we buy, we really, it, it's not something that we have to kind of weigh. Um, it, it, they're just kind of standard products. Okay. I think we'd have to create a defensible position <clears throat> if we chose to buy another product that it was so outrageously more to buy the green product. And I think they put that in there, again, it's kind of a safeguard, so it's kind of a good thing. but. I, I remember when the law went into effect, we really haven't had any significant differences. I think the right. point Mr. Baker made. Any other questions? Then we'll move to the vote on approving the first reading of poly, policy DJ and the exhibits that go with it. All those in favor? Okay, we have seven affirmative. Student member concurs. Motion carries. We have also to do this evening a first reading to rescind policy DJG professional services contracts and the exhibits that go with it. DJE1, DJ, DJGE2, DJGE1. <laughs> and DJGE2. The policy committee reviewed policy DJG and exhibits DJE1 and DJGE2 as public work session on February 10th, 2022 at the request of staff. The policy exhibits are being recommended for rescission because the contents of them have been combined with policy DJ entailed purchasing standards place an administrative regulation DJR entitled purchasing procedures or determined to not be necessary. The committee is requesting that the Board of Education approve the first reading to rescind policy DJG and exhibits DJGE1 and DJGE2. 
there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy DJG entitled Professional Services Contract, Exhibit DJGE1 entitled Professional Services Contracts, and Exhibit DJGE2 entitled Professional Services Contracts Definitions. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Any questions or discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approval of the first reading? All right. We have seven affirmative. The motion carries. Is the student member concurring? I just want to say. Hopefully it's on my watch. At some point we're going to get to policy R2, D2. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Up on the May 4th meeting. Yeah, right, May 4th. Oh, yeah. May 4th. <laughs> Good one. Thank you, Mr. Bakedal. Okay, we'll move now to the superintendent's report, Dr. Michael. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Williams, board members. We're going to move quickly through several recognitions. Uh, the first of which is Maintenance Worker Day, which is this Friday. Our uh, trades team just does an outstanding job of maintaining our buildings, and I've asked Mr. Stauffer if he would just mention a few things about our trades team and some of the work that they do. Mr. Stauffer. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Uh, in order for essential systems and infrastructure to continue working properly, they need to be maintained. Without regular maintenance, systems will break unexpectedly more often and will cost more in the long run. In some instances, avoiding a maintenance can even be dangerous. With the aging infrastructure of our schools, the actions performed by our maintenance workers become increasingly important. WCPS employs 34 maintenance employees who complete about 15,000 repair orders a year. The role is critical to support students in a safe learning environment. So how do maintenance employees help? Carpenters install and repair doors that keep us safe and secure. Plumbers keep faucets running to help and stay germ free. Uh, HVAC technicians keep our climate control units operating to keep you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Painters help the walls fresh and clean with a new cone of paint, brightening the environment. Electricians help areas keep areas well lit and they keep power flowing to your electronic devices. So roofers keep the rain and snow outside so you stay dry and mechanics keep the operations equipment used in and around schools functioning properly. There's no doubt about it. These skilled employees help build a better place to learn and work. Many times they are working in the background and you never know what needed repaired or serviced. The next time you see one of the maintenance team, say hello, or better yet, thank you for a job well done. So just a couple quick facts. The average number of work orders completed per day by employee is 2.85, which again was 15,000 per year. Uh, this year it looks like we're gonna have a little more than 15,000. So job well done, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Again, I wanna thank our maintenance workers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mentioned some of the routine maintenance, but these people are often called in a crisis. I've seen them down in a ditch in a freezing cold, repairing water line breaks, electrical breaks. Uh, repairing roofs, you know, during the middle after storms. Uh, most recently, one of our elementary schools, a, bi a pipe broke, and we had the whole team out there, <coughs> a whole variety of people, <coughs> sopping up boiler water that had seeped all over the building. Uh, it was quite a mess, but this is the team that gets out and gets it done along with our custodial staff. Uh, at this time, we want to recognize National School, Count uh, School Social Worker Week, which is next week. So I'm going to ask Ms. Huffer and Ms. Hartman to come forward. I think they're going to tag team an effort here to highlight our social workers again that we'll be celebrating next week. Good evening, Dr. Michael, President Williams, and members of the board. I'm Helen Huffer, Supervisor of School Counseling, and with me is Connie Hartman, Supervisor of Special Education for District Programs. We appreciate the opportunity to recognize and celebrate National School Social Worker Week. We would like to acknowledge the work our 33 school social workers do on a daily basis for our schools through our behavioral support programs, special education needs, and mental health needs. They are a valuable resource to the schools they serve, 
lending their clinical expertise in a variety of settings. This year's theme is Time to Shine, which appropriately shares the critical need for social work services in the school setting to provide important therapeutic services to students and their families, as well as provide linkages and referrals for services outside of WCPS. Thank you to our WCPS school social workers for your dedication and support to students, staff members, and families. Okay, thank you very much. Let's now it's done. Thank our social workers next week. Uh, our last recognition tonight is Foreign Language Week is next week, National Foreign Language Week. Uh, so again, March 6th through the 12th, and Paula Moore, supervisor of ESOL and World Languages, is here to share some information about our foreign language team. Paula? Bonsoir, <laughs> buenas noches, guten Abend, konbanwa, bonum vesperum TB. Good evening in the five languages taught here in Washington County. I'm proud of our 42 French, German, Japanese, Latin, and Spanish teachers who teach approximately 500 elementary, 2,600 middle, and 2,500 high school students. WCPS is a proud leader in language learning. In 2017, we were the first school system in the state to award the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy a state graduation honor that certifies a high level of proficiency in two languages on nationally recognized assessments. Last year, WCPS ranked fourth in the state for the Seal of Biliteracy Awards with 67 seniors in WCPS earning this credential. This is quite an accomplishment as Maryland has one of the highest standards in the nation and is just one third of states who use the intermediate high level of proficiency. And behind every great student is a great teacher. WCPS has had four teachers become Maryland Language Teacher of the Year in the past seven years. And since 2005, three World Language Teachers have been WCPS Teacher of the Year. And nearly one third of our World Language Teachers have earned the Global Seal of Biliteracy, which is an international credential that is a professional credential. It is an honor to prepare our students for an interconnected, globally diverse world and lead an accomplished team of teachers who value a multilingual and multicultural education. Thank you for your continued support and leadership in languages. Anytime our foreign language or EL teachers get together, they love to have a good time, so they, they love to celebrate. So I'm sure they're gonna love celebrating next week as National Foreign Language Week. This time I'm going to ask Dr. Willow to bring us a brief update on our dropout and graduation rates that were recently released last week at the state board meeting. It's never easy to follow Paula Moore. Uh, I don't have a fancy introduction for you, uh, but good evening. I can do good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Willow. Good evening, President Williams, uh, members of the board, Dr. Michael. And tonight I am going to share a little bit about cohort graduation and dropout rates. So when we look at graduation rates or dropout rates, we have to remember that it is a cohort model, which means we look at when a student enters their freshman year and we go four years for graduation. A couple things to keep in mind. We're only looking at four-year statistics tonight. We do have some seniors that are still finishing and working toward their diploma, but they're currently in their fifth year of, of school. That is not uncommon. Uh, in some cases, especially with the pandemic, that is something we continue to work with students so that they're able to earn their diploma. Those students would not be factored into the data that I'm going to share with you this evening. All right, as we look at the WCPS four-year cohort graduation rate, WCPS is in blue and Maryland is in red. In 2021, we were at 90.9% graduation rate. Again, that is the number of high school seniors that graduated in four years. The state average was 87.2. When we look at dropout rates, again, WCPS is in blue and Maryland is in red. So if you looked and you would wonder why they don't quite add up to 100%, again, that has to do with some of our students that are still finishing. So we were at 6.2%. We've been fairly consistent in, in both, a couple tenths of a percentage point here and there, but 
that's typically where we're at. In Maryland, when a student at 18 chooses to go to their, earn their GED, that is considered a dropout, <coughs> even though the student is earning uh, the alternative diploma. So that is included into these statistics. And I'll answer any questions that you might have on that. longitudinal data kept um, or any kind of follow-up with dropouts who go on to pursue a GED or I'm not aware of the of a, a firm number that I can give you we certainly could follow up with uh, some of our partners to see that I will say you know in terms of dropout and graduation rate we talk about this at 18 and it's the senior year it really begins the freshman year and honestly before that uh, when students that when we look at the profile of a student that doesn't finish high school it's usually poor attendance that causes them to fall behind academically and once you fall behind with credits you might stick to your senior year but when you're going into your senior year and you need two math or two English credits a social studies a science and your schedule is um, packed with academic classes it becomes even more challenging. And so that's the importance of what we did last summer uh, in expanding our summer school programming, expanding opportunities during the day, but also before, after school, the twilight programs, uh, because we know that last year and the year before that, we're, we're coming up on two years here in March uh, where the pandemic has been with us and has impacted us. But to, as you look at these statistics, you can go back prior to that and certainly see you know, when we talk about the importance of being in school every day, the importance of not falling behind and working with students uh, when they do fall behind, working with our families, uh, early intervention is key to seeing success. I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and maybe you don't know this answer. I wonder what the, the difference was in the dropout rate when we were at a seven period class versus the four or six or whatever mod we have now. I wonder what the difference is, if, there, if that makes any difference from people dropping out then versus dropping out now because you have to make up so much in a short period of time wherein when you had that seven period, you didn't. It just seems like when I was in school, we didn't have as many dropouts. Well, I'm just wondering. Say, my experience, Mr. Gessard, you probably, we just didn't talk about dropouts. When I took over for Bill McKinley 100 years ago and, and the executive director of secondary education, I think we ran about 550 dropouts a year, 550 individual students. I could be wrong, but it was somewhere around that number. Now we're dropping out about 100 children a year. So I, I think it'd be hard to like pick the seven period days. You know, so many things have changed since right. then. We're actually moving our high school model back to a modified four period day. Uh, and we're hoping to be able to pick up some additional uh, periods during the day, an opportunity to, for some to make a fresh start in January. I think we had greater success with that schedule. Um, so we're making some changes to try to address not only dropout, we also have to address, you know, obviously the graduation rate as far as the 20% going on in testing for upcoming for some of the coursework. There's a lot of changes again coming for us again. The GED comment uh, question on dropouts, that's actually become very difficult to pass. And our students need to be pretty well prepared or prepared prepped for the GED. And I'm, I don't know how many GED students. That used to be under kind of a one of our wings that's moved to HCC at this point. So we could do some follow-up with them. Probably going to be a wide range of people, probably you know, 18, 19 year olds as well as 25 year old, 30 year olds getting their GED. They do longitudinal studies of graduates, don't they? They used to. We do follow up for students going into two year college, entering college in their first year, finishing college in four years. There's some particularly college work done that way. And the dropout rate, as you say, is probably down because I think you're probably right on those numbers. I remember when Bill was, was in your job, uh, not a superintendent, but yeah. the job that you shared with him or took over. But we have more interventions to programs to keep these kids in school and to work with them. Counselors, social workers, that type of thing. Needs. Inter intervention specialist. Unfortunately, the needs of our students have increased yes. as well. Yes. But Mr. Stauffer, that's an excellent point. Our, our school staff, our counselors, our 
our teachers, our administrators, our student intervention specialists, uh, they're to be commended, uh, not just for the work that they've done over the past two years, but the work that they've done prior to that to reduce this rate. We obviously still have more work to do. Uh, we'd like to see that number continue uh, to lower, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that our students have those skills to be ready to go on to what comes next, whether that's college, whether that's a career, whether that's the military. So we'll continue to work at it. We'll have a great deal of work to do in the next couple of years because I'm concerned about the number of ninth, 10th graders that haven't earned their credits at this point. So we could see a ripple from COVID for several years to come. At this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Joe Allen to join Dr. Willow, and we're going to have a technology, a brief technology update. I think uh, this has already been shared with the curriculum team and the finance team, so I'm going to ask the gentleman to kind of move through this, um, kind of our big overarching technology plan. A lot of credit to Mr. Allen. Remind me again how long you've been here? A uh, year and a week. A year and a week. So just seems like five or six years so far, baby. <laughs> Mr. Allen's made tremendous progress in our technology department. He's pulled together a great team. He's got our resources better aligned. He has a long-term plan set out for us, and we just want to briefly share a little bit of that with you tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. I'm Joe Allen, Executive Director of Technology. So tonight I'm gonna to present the WCPS Strategic Technology Plan just as an, an update for you. Uh, the outcomes we're looking for is just really a high-level view of the plan as well as I want to illustrate some of the strategies and initiatives to sustainably support the instruction and operational technology needs of WCPS. The plan is a living document. It's not set in stone. It will change as conditions change or technology changes. And it's really a sensible plan to keep the technology that supports our students and staff and teachers and schools moving in a secure, reliable, and efficient way. Learning is a student-driven process. Students need the opportunity to use age-appropriate technology in their learning experiences. It's essential that students and staff have access to not only the hardware, but also a collection of resources, including multimedia tools, web-based applications, <coughs> and content-specific materials. Technology impacts instruction in a number of ways, from as simple as taking attendance and communicating with parents, to allowing for personalized learning experiences that will help close academic gaps. A strong technology plan that is fiscally responsible ensures that WCPS students and staff not only have these tools today, but in the future. So in alignment with the Washington County Public Schools vision for building a community that inspires curiosity, creativity, and achievement, the strategic plan provides a framework and specific actions to ensure students and staff have access to appropriate systems, digital tools, up-to-date devices, essential classroom technology, and secure infrastructure to support teaching, learning, and administrative productivity throughout WCPS. A secure, reliable, and efficient technology environment is necessary to facilitate instruction, provide engaging learning experiences, provide opportunities for students to acquire the knowledge and skills to become global citizens and pursue meaningful, rewarding employment. Those three words, secure, reliable, and efficient, are our guiding principles that will be the lens by which we make decisions. Our technology mission is crafted around the desire to sustain, optimize, and grow the investments that WCPS has already made and have enabled one-to-one -one student device ratios, equipped schools and classrooms with the necessary technology and infrastructure to support personalized learning and student-centered approaches to instruction. Moreover, the plan will focus on elements which further provide equity, encourage innovation, and enable <coughs> secure, reliable, efficient technology solutions. Some of the strategies to support the plan are deliver uh, solid foundational technology, which I'll describe in greater detail in just a moment. It's to commit to a sustainable technology life cycle. It's to have standards, but ones that are flexible to uh, match conditions in, in various schools, like we heard earlier about schools with no walls, some classrooms with no walls. And it's really to optimize our technology footprint. So in this building, there is a data center, and there's another data center uh, in another location, but we really need to decide how much technology do we need here versus how much should be in the cloud so that we find that right balance. At the core of the technology plan are initiatives, products, services, policies, and processes that provide that foundation for secure, reliable data and solutions for all tech students, technology, students, teachers, administrators, staff, and parents. 
that foundational technology is key to a sustainable technology environment from a fiscal and predictability perspective and enables current and future innovation throughout the district without compromising the core framework of the foundation. Just to break down the, the elements of this, so there are, to use a sports analogy, it's really like the blocking and tackling. These eight items that are here are really the basics of the foundation that will keep WCPS technology sound and secure, which the innovation frameworks are built upon. So we have systems and applications, which are things like uh, the student information system, Munis, which is the financial and HR system, Google, which we use in classrooms for productivity and collaboration, and Microsoft, which is email and also productivity. We have end user devices. We have Chromebooks and staff laptops. Classroom technology is made up of projectors, adapters, cables. <laughs> Sustainable life cycle management, which I'll mention in a minute, is really the strategic timing and the acquisition of technology solutions. Infrastructure is routers, switches, firewalls, Wi-Fi access points like we just had a moment ago, servers, UPS devices. Student safety and cybersecurity. This is filtering and monitoring of, of what's going on. It's digital tools review committee, which looks at every single tool to say, do we need this? Can we afford this? How does this uh, further education? It's our data sharing agreement, which is a legal agreement that uh, it's common among different contracts that we have. So we're not at the whim of each vendor. We use our, our agreement so that makes sure that we protect our data and our student privacy. And it's training all of our staff. Each year they have to take cybersecurity training and, and be up to date on, on phishing and other things that are going on. We're going to recommend updating some policies and regulations uh, in this area. And lastly, their support is per perpetual integral part of successful use of and maximizing technology investments. So what you're looking at now, this is the technology life cycle. So this is an example of the types of technology that WCPS uses and how they need to be refreshed according to their life cycle. So a lot of people may not know what the technology is, but you can see down the list Telephones, projectors, copiers, network items, servers, Wi-Fi, they all have a service life to them. And at the end of that service life, they need to be replaced. Oftentimes, uh, a vendor will uh, not support the item or it becomes a security risk because it's not supported, it's not getting refreshes. So this is just an example of the life cycle of various things. Uh, I, I heard a nice quote tonight, as Mr. Becker said, we cannot drive on bald tires, but in this case, nor do we have to if we commit to this life cycle. This is an example of what a Chromebook life cycle looks like. So if you see the green square, you know, if we continuously buy 6,000 to 6,500 devices, depending on student populations, we buy them in the green cycle, in the green squares, and then about five years later, they retire. We have a constant flow moving in, so we always have dependable devices for students, and it's, it's efficient for the classroom. They don't have to have disruptions over equipment that doesn't work. This is an example of the types of technology that are in schools. So students have a Chromebook, they have a case, a charger. Uh, elementary schools have an iPad, which we're phasing out over the next couple of years. Teachers have a laptop, Chromebook, charger, adapters. Some have an iPad in the elementary levels. Classrooms have a projector, they have power strips, adapters, cables. And schools have telephones, copiers, access points, and, and network cabling. This next slide really outlines the costs of what it takes to commit to the sustainable life cycle management. We must efficiently use our funds without creating funding cliffs. So if we bought all new computers this year, in four years we'd be having to spend a lot of money to buy all, for all new computers in, in four or five years. So by buying small quantities of things over time, we avoid those funding cliffs. Funding for the, the strategic uh, technology life cycle management, it exists in the technology general fund today and in, in ESSER will be used as a bridge until we reach some of that blueprint funding in FY25 and 6. This really meets the needs of instruction and it's a sensible plan. Professional development starts right when we onboard teachers at the Teacher Induction Academy, which I know several of you have attended previously. But technology also support comes from central office with our ed tech coaches and we also do a, a good number of trainings with our school-based staff because when you need something uh, at the school level, it's easier to have that answer right there at the school level. So the trainer uh, training, the trainer model, allows us the ability to ensure that our schools have the support that they need. We also uh, 
once, sometimes twice a month, focus on Tech Tip uh, Tuesdays, where we will also send out updates uh, from central office to teachers based on the feedback that we're hearing and the needs uh, from our staff. And my last slide is just an example of some of the, the priorities and initiatives that will be happening this year and next year and the, and the following year. So just to go through some of these, evaluating the bandwidth of schools. We really need to prepare for tomorrow. There's, there's, there's uh, 4K television and, and holograms and all kinds of things that are happening out there and that the kids need to have the, that we have to have the bandwidth that will support that as they come to, to be. Uh, copiers and, and print solutions, you know, at the schools, uh, it's all at end of life. So we will be seeking this year to, to replace that equipment uh, so that that's not a problem at schools. We've already talked about moving some of our, our technology, such as the Munis system, the HR and finance system, to the cloud. That requires an upgrade this year. Um, optimizing the technology footprint. So if the things that move to the cloud, we no longer need servers, and there's opportunities to save money on licensing, on, on actual hardware, and, and other things. Uh, so we need to find that balance. We want to recommend policy and regulation upgrades over the next couple of years that will not so much change what they are, but bring them in line with what current technology is today. Every summer, we between June and, and August, there's school uh, projectors, there's new wiring, and there's infrastructure upgrades. Those, those occur each summer. Um, as we talked about in December, the Synergy Student Information System is already migrating to the cloud, and that will be finished in the June timeframe. Uh, some, some portion of staff will have new devices. This is a cyclical event, as is for students. So there are purchases and then implementations that occur at the end of each year and in the summertime. And the last thing that we're focused on is the, the telephone system. So it's, uh, it's also reached the end of its life. So at some point <laughs> next year, we're going to be assessing where we are with that and looking at a new solution for that. And that's all, it's all part of the, uh, the life cycle plan that I presented. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for the update. Board members, in your packet this Friday, we're going to send some information that the technology team met with senior staff on Monday. Uh, actually went through some of the technician, work order, response uh, efforts that we have at the school level, as well as the timeline to move uh, Synergy into the cloud, which is going to make that faster, more reliable, have more security features to it. So a little bit of information. You don't need to necessarily understand it, but I thought I'd include it in Friday's updates. And I think the team's done a good job pulling things together. Again, I want to thank uh, Mr. Allen for his efforts in his year and one week. And uh, a lot has happened in that time period. He's really got us pulled together with a solid plan here going uh, forward that we can financially fund that's manageable with the team of people we have uh, that keeps us current. Uh, he's really discovered some things that we needed to get corrected and get on the right path. And he's just done an excellent job of doing that. And Gary and the PD team and Ann and others have, have done an excellent job working with their instructional staff. Um, I just wanted to check on uh, Chromebook supplies. Is that eased up at all? Or we, I remember there was a real run on Chromebooks, obviously, before. Have we seen that catch up? It, it definitely has eased up. I, I think you're going to see me next meeting asking for the Chromebooks. And we're coming pretty early because we want to make sure that we're not caught in any supplier delays. So we don't really need them until July. But if we order them now, we'll make sure that we can avoid those delays. Got it. And did I hear you say that we're, we're phasing out iPads from elementary schools and replacing them with Chromebooks? Correct. We did a pile of that uh, the last two years. Currently, we have uh, Abel, Bester, Emma K. Daub, and I think I'm missing one that are piloting uh, Chromebooks. Do they have the touch technology yes. on the screen? Okay. Yes. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, the only other two comments I wanted to make tonight, we had our ESP uh, awards uh, Facebook Live uh, ceremony last week. Diane Longnecker is our ES 2222 ESP uh, of the year. And it was great to have uh, her win. She's a 20-year veteran here at Boonesboro Middle School. Uh, well known, well respected in the Boonesboro community uh, at the school, like the students and staff really appreciate her and her efforts. At the March 15th meeting, we hope to have our five finalists and be able to recognize our five finalists for ESP. You know, the comment I wanted to make tonight, we're on really day, I don't know that we had anything on Sunday, but we day four of um, optional masking so far that's gone very well Friday. We had the opportunity to attend uh, South Harrisdown High School where we had one of our community-wide student events in cooperation with the city. 
Um, many students opted to wear their masks, many students opted not to wear their masks, and staff and volunteers. Uh, Saturday, I was at a, a regional wrestling, very large crowd at Boonesboro High School that day. It was a, kind of an all-day event. Um, again, I was there for a couple hours. Uh, again, people, you know, some choosing to wear their masks, some choosing not, and uh, was, you know, well done. And then yesterday, today, we've had two good days. Again, we're respecting the right for people to wear a mask or not wear a mask, and I think our students and staff have done very well with that so far. And we appreciate that. So I just appreciate teachers, uh, student staff, and everyone that's cooperating, respecting the rights of each other. So that's all I have tonight, Ms. Wayne. Thank you, Dr. Michael. This time we'll move to personnel action. And it's Dr. Pugh with us this evening. Good evening, President Williams, Dr. Michael, members of the board. Um, as discussed earlier in closed session today, there's a number of staff changes before you for your consideration. At this time, I ask for your approval of personal <coughs> actions. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Is there a motion? President Williams. I move to approve the personnel actions dated Tuesday, March 1st, 2022, as presented in closed session. Thank you. Where is your second? second? Thank you, Dr. Zetmeyer. Any questions for Dr. Pugh? Any discussion? And we'll move to the vote, voting to approve the personnel actions <coughs> dated. Tuesday, March 1st, as presented in closed session, <coughs> in favor, and we have seven affirmative, three unanimous. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we are up to reports to the board, board member committee reports. Dr. Zetmeyer, would you like to begin? C and I had a jam-packed agenda yesterday, including items that you, some you saw tonight. Progress on the diesel technology curriculum um, at Tech High. Thank you, Mr. Aylshire and Ms. Moore for that. Uh, an update on our technology plan, which you saw, which includes Chromebooks for our youngest learners, and we'll learn about that next, week, next meeting. And Frostburg's new Grow Your Own Teachers Master Program. Um, and grant opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Willow, for your leadership and updates on those topics. C and I will meet here again uh, March 20th at 1.30. Thank you. Uh, March 30th? 20th. 20th at 1.30. March 20th, 1.30. <laughs> Thank you. I hope. Mr. Evans. Yes, we uh, met uh, I guess it was a week ago today, on uh, February 22nd. Uh, I was the only board member able to make the meeting there, but uh, we were still able to talk about a couple different things. We talked about the budget that was uh, brought up today. We also talked about the tech plan that you all just read about. Um, I did uh, have a couple concerns. I, I think it's great we're moving forward with technology, but as we spend more money, obviously we need to keep the budget balanced. So uh, plan, uh, I, I was pretty uh, pleased with the plan that was put forth. Also, uh, they talked about new money that will be required from the, uh, from the state as well to kind of uh, fund, fund a lot of these initiatives as well. So I uh, had a lot of good discussion. Um, and then uh, we were, we originally set up to meet on Friday, April 29th, but I guess a couple of the staff members had some uh, conflicts with that date, so I'll be uh, uh, emailing to see what would be a good day to reschedule there. Thank you. Mr. Evans, Mr. Gasford? The committee meets tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock in the Funkstown room. Um, on our agenda will be a presentation of <laughs> by Mr. Gupta um, and review of the policy IKC, the grading system for secondary schools. Um, we'll also be going through comments we've received on um, other uh, policies and uh, Dr. Willow will be a special guest. We'll be talking through some potential changes to the policy for school sponsored trips. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. I have nothing. Okay. Mr. Gupta, did you have something for student government? <clears throat> yes, I did. Um, uh, last Wednesday, we had our General Assembly. 
It was very successful. We had a huge turnout of, um, I want to say, I think 79 students. Um, and it's a lot better than our previous one, because our previous one got postponed, and that had 17 students. So I think, <laughs> I think 79 is a little bit better. Um, we got a lot of feedback, um, including on class rank and also on how the General Assembly went. A lot of students loved it. Um, we talked about implementing action plans and how they can use student councils in their own schools. Um, and we had them develop plans at the GA on how they can go back to their own student councils and change things, talk to their administrators, talk to their teachers, um, talk to their custodians. Um, we talked about bullying and we talked about mental health. It's two very much loved topics. Uh, students love discussing about those. I have uh, nothing to report from the legislative response team. I will say that uh, on Monday, February 28th, Mr. Stauffer and I attended the MABE Legislative Committee. Mr. Stauffer as our representative and me as an observer. Did you have anything that you wanted to share? No, not really. Okay. A lot of bills just get, getting introduced and making their way through the process. And, They'll be amended and changed, and some of them will die in committee. They won't even get out, so. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have miscellaneous business, and we have one thing <coughs> under that, and that is future agenda items. Coming up at our next meeting, March 15th, we will have Mrs. Cade here for a legislative briefing. Uh, we will also revisit our general fund operating budget for fiscal year 2023. We have several recognitions that evening, as well as a um, presentation that will be an update of the blueprint uh, situation. Um, and also that evening we'll have an equity update. In April, the first meeting in April, we have several <coughs> recognitions and we have a presentation about our birth to five services. And also at our first meeting in April, staff will be bringing a request for approval of a bid in response to an RFP for a superintendent of schools executive search recruitment services. So that's it for future agenda items. If you have <laughs> suggestions for uh, future agendas, please let a member of the Agenda Planning Committee know. We had our first in-person Agenda <coughs> Planning Committee meeting in quite a while. We've had work sessions and whatnot that have kept us from meeting in person, and so it was good to be back in person today. So that's it for future agenda items. We'll move now to board member comments. Mr. Gupta, would you like to begin? Uh, sure. So um, this morning I had the uh, um, unique experience of testifying to the county commissioners along with two um, other students, one from BISPA and uh, one from uh, South High, about uh, funding our budget and how students believe we should have a f uh, funded budget. Um, going in there, I had low expectations. I thought I would get a lot of um, blank uh, stares and they'll be like, okay, whatever, we're gonna have this meeting and um, we can have anyway, whatever. Um, instead, uh, when, all, when all the students were speaking, we got a lot of nods, we got a lot of recognizing that there is a problem. We talked a lot about mental health. We talked about how the board members think mental health is a pretty big concern. Um, and at the end of my comments, uh, Commissioner Burkett, um, I believe Commissioner Burkett um, said, uh, he, was, he didn't need to, but he said that the county has money, and the county um, is looking into full, uh, funding the budget. I don't remember the exact terms, but he did say uh, multiple times in the meeting, and other county commissioners, the county is flush with cash. So I want to be hopeful, and I hope that the county will fund our budget. Um, they might not, but they might also. And um, as uh, Mr. Bickford said, if, if there's a year that it should be done, it should be this year, because the county has the money. Um, we have things in our budget that I believe is very necessary, and I have conveyed that uh, to the county commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Mrs. Murray. Yes, I, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Tanish. Uh, I watched the meeting. I was very pleasantly surprised to see Tanish and May Cruz and Ethan Yamashita talk to the county commissioners. They spoke very well. 
I was very impressed and um, told them that they uh, there was a critical need and that they needed to fully fund our budget. So thank you very much for stepping up and doing that. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to call out two of my friends who recently who returned to teaching this year after some time away from teaching. And despite the um, challenges that we hear about at every meeting, which obviously we're, we're all trying to tackle, it's very refreshing to hear um, both of them separately reach out to me and say how much they're enjoying the job, how much they feel like they're making a difference. Um, so it's challenging, but it's a positive experience for them. And uh, so I just wanted to call attention to that, that staff do fantastic jobs. And I think some people are coming back into the workforce because they feel a need to contribute, especially when it comes to teaching. So I appreciate that. Mr. Southbrook? Nothing. I'm ready to vote. Mr. Gessner? Yeah, some disturbing um, photos have come across the um, social media sites. Uh, one uh, was given to us, I made mean, two weeks ago, and it was um, where a, a couple students were attacking a police officer in our school. And I know that um, there's a lot of things that go on that we, we don't know about. Um, that one had, happened to be it shared um, to, to me through um, a cell phone. And I was really um, disheartened to find that our society and our students have lowered their standards that they would attack a police officer. To me, I grew, I grew up with respect of all adults, but of one in particular would have been a police officer, and I would have never attacked him. I hope that um, in the future um, that we can work with our legislators <coughs> to um, reverse some of the uh, mandates and policies of um, students attacking a, a police officer in our schools, because I feel that there is there is no need for any of that um, going on in our public school system. And I was very disappointed to see students um, reacting that way, because if they will attack a police officer, they will attack a teacher or another student, and it's only time that that's going to happen, and it probably already has happened. But we cannot allow this in our Washington County public school system. And as long as I'm still here, I'm going to start working on meeting with our legislators to change that. And I hope that if I'm still around um, another year or two, that that could be a part of our legislative priorities, that we, we have discussions about that, because I just don't feel like we are doing enough uh, for our our teachers when it comes to um, behavioral issues in our schools and when I saw that police officer being attacked I knew we didn't we haven't done enough so um, just very disappointed in our society that we have lowered ourselves that um, our mental health has gotten to us uh, and maybe we'll use the the masks um, mandate as a, an issue but I think there's a lot more um, going on in the family unit that we need to change and we need to address it so I hope in the future that we can do that. Thank you, Mr. Gessford. Mr. Evans. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Gessford. That is a uh, big problem, very well said. Uh, um, the, the state does tie our hands with, uh, um, as far as some of these laws that are passed. So um, I have a concern with that, so I, I would like to reiterate that. But uh, another thing I'd like to say, too, is it's great to see everyone's face. Um, I, uh, I think uh, 14 months we've been on the board now. Uh, this is the first time I think I've seen some of your faces, so I apologize if I, uh, <laughs> if I don't recognize you or call you the wrong name or whatever, but uh, um, I, I appreciate us uh, having the ability to, to make this choice. Um, one thing that I was concerned about, I was happy to hear, Dr. Michael, that you, uh, you, you seem to see a pretty positive response where people are respecting the choice. Um, I would certainly hope that uh, any issues that may arise, I, I, I was quite honestly worried about 
about it, but um, it seems like it's not really an issue. And uh, if there are any issues that arise where someone, you know, is bullying one way or another for, for wearing the mask or not, that I'd, I'd hope it get nipped in the butt uh, extremely quickly and that we, we can continue with, uh, with respecting people's choices and decisions and, uh, and get back to a, a normal life here. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Dr. Detmar. In 1736, 22 year old Captain Jonathan Hager landed in America and quickly moved to Frederick County, now Washington County, and built his house, Hager's Fancy, on a 200 acre track, which quickly became 4,000 acres, and founded Elizabethtown, now Hagerstown. He was a leader from the very beginning. He had a ranger scouts in the Indian and the French Indian War, worked with George Washington, and was the first American of German birth to be elected a delegate in the congressional legislation in 1771. He championed independence. All this to say is we have German roots. So I grew up with this being Fasnacht Day. <laughs> I don't know how many of you did, but here in Washington County, everyone had a fast knot on the day before Ash Wednesday that ushered in Lent. And although New Orleans is the unofficial first place of Mardi Gras in 1699, the first official Mardi Gras was in Mobile, which was in, is now Alabama, but it was the first capital of Louisiana. Roots of Mardi Gras trace back to Roman celebrations of spring coming. So, all this to say, enjoy your donut, and spring is right around the corner. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zedmeyer. Thank you for the Foss Nuts. Mr. Stauffer, thank you, too, for the Foss Nuts that you brought and shared Anybody earlier today. Anybody wants any, there's still some back there. <laughs> I have nothing other than to say I'm looking forward to reading at Greenbrier on Friday um, in celebration of reading a wonderful thing. Okay. Dr. Michael, do you have any parting uh, words for us this no. evening? No, nothing. So we stand adjourned. Thank you.